Here we are at uh, Wednesday, the 27th of January. Again, as a reminder to our participants today, uh, we do have representatives uh, who are linking in and viewing the meetings from uh, at least uh, four different time zones that we know of. So uh, we are largely operating in Alaska and Yukon time in respect of our agenda uh, to uh, recognize that the majority of the, uh, the panel members and advisors uh, are within those respective uh, time zones. So as far as our bilateral sessions for the day are planned, uh, we will be starting this morning with uh, initially the presentation on 2020 Yukon River Main Stem Chum Sa Salmon Season Summary, both uh, from the U.S. as well as from Canada. And as a reminder to panel members, uh, we will receive both the U.S followed by the Canadian presentations, and then uh, we will be taking panel member uh, questions on all of the information presented. So as we move through the presentations this morning, so for panel members, uh, perhaps uh, keep track of your, your questions, uh, take notes, and then we will uh, provide the opportunity for collective questions and discussion. We'll be, uh, we will be taking a break uh, at, uh, after approximately an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, we'll have a 15 minute break and then be resuming at 10.30 Alaska time, 12.30 Yukon time. Uh, and our second session of the morning will involve presentation of the 2020 uh, Porcupine Chum Salmon Season Summary, both US and Canadian uh, presentations. Again, the order will follow the same as this morning's session, which is we will receive both the U.S. and the Canadian presentations, followed by panel member questions. The second session of the morning will be 1.5 hours in duration. We will break for uh, a one-hour period at uh, noon Alaska time, 2 o'clock Yukon time, and resume in bilateral sessions at 1 o'clock Alaska time, 3 o'clock Yukon time. Our afternoon session will be approximately two hours and uh, 15 minutes in duration. Uh, this afternoon's uh, session will start off with a bilateral panel discussion on coordinated U.S. and Canadian management. I know that there was uh, some questions and discussion amongst panel members to have the opportunity for that dialogue. So that will be our first item for this afternoon. And then the session will transition to receiving information on the Yukon River Salmon Restoration and Enhancement Fund, starting with an update on uh, implementation of projects funded in the 2020 uh, year, and followed by the call for proposals and current status of 2021 Restoration and Enhancement Fund projects proposed for the coming year. As a brief reminder, we will be receiving uh, public testimony this afternoon. I understand we have a uh, number of uh, individuals and participants who have registered for public testimony. We've set aside 30 minutes. Uh, if, uh, if time permits and if, uh, if uh, schedules allow, uh, we may start testimony early uh, in order to ensure that we adhere to our, our schedule. Uh, we just want to ensure that there is sufficient time for all of the uh, individuals who have uh, signed up for testimony to, to do so uh, by our scheduled conclusion time of the testimony period, which is 3 o'clock Alaska time, 5 o'clock Yukon time. Uh, bilateral session will then conclude with approximately 15 uh, minutes to confirm scheduling of the Yukon River Panel's 2021 preseason meeting, as well as closing remarks. That uh, I will check with Mr. Co-Chair uh, from the United States. Uh, do you uh, agree, concur with the agenda as proposed, or any uh, amendments or additions you would like to uh, bring forward? Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. No, no amendments or changes. And I guess, at least for the record, uh, my name is John Linderman. I'm with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game Division of Commercial Fisheries, uh, AY. UK regional supervisor and uh, serving as the U.S. co-chair to the Yukon River panel. Um, I think we can proceed with the agenda as described. Um, if we do have additional time, if we manage to save some time to provide for um, and accommodate um, public testimony, 
um, that would be great. And we'll just uh, keep, try and keep that in mind as we proceed. Uh, Want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity there. Um, I guess maybe one question uh, for PSC, have we received any additional signups um, for public testimony since, uh, since yesterday? Victor, if we have you on the line, uh, could you provide a brief update, please? Hello. Yes. Um, yes. We um, we have the. There's been no change to the uh, testimonial list. Uh, we'll forward an updated list to the co-chairs uh, at lunchtime today. Okay. Thank you. Chair, sure. uh, and so with that, uh, we will proceed with our. Agenda for this morning. Uh, the first item, number one, uh, is uh, perhaps a refresher, and that is the review of the 2020 Yukon River Panel's uh, management recommendations to the parties. So, uh, Tom, if you could bring those up uh, on screen just to remind our, uh, our panel members and advisors uh, to set the context for the subsequent uh, presentations. And uh, while we wait for that to appear, there it is. Uh, just to confirm, uh, the Yukon River panel provided four bilateral recommendations uh, to the parties uh, in advance of the 2020 season. Uh, the majority of the recommendations focused on the Chinook salmon um, stock and, and the Chinook salmon season, although a number uh, were also applicable to uh, management considerations uh, during the uh, the chum salmon seasons. Uh, so uh, I won't necessarily read through the four recommendations uh, as I understand that uh, these will be covered off in the subsequent presentations, but uh, merely uh, setting a foundation for panel members uh, in advance of initiating the, uh, the postseason reporting. So with that, we will now transition to item number two on the agenda which is the 2020 Yukon River Main Stem Chum Salmon uh, Season Summary uh, uh, US presentation. And I understand we will be joined by Jeff Estenson and Bonnie Borba from the Alaska Department of Fish and Game for this presentation. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair, can everybody hear me okay? I can hear you uh, loud yes. and clear and of course, thank you. Okay, so uh, just as a, as a FYI to US section members that uh, this, the slides for this presentation are contained in the, uh, the presentation packet for day two. As we just mentioned, this is agenda item number two. Um, and you can probably find this somewhere about halfway down the packet. So um, that's where you can find these slides. Um, as folks are getting there, I'll just say good morning to all. Uh, this presentation will summarize the Yukon area fall season for fall chum and coho. I am Jeff Estenson, the fall season manager for ADFNG, and I will be summarizing the in-season assessment and management. Then I will pass it on to Bonnie Borba, the fall season research biologist, who will summarize post-season assessment and briefly summarize the coho salmon season. I think it goes without saying that the year 2020 and the fishing season were difficult while we navigated the concerns and issues that are associated with the pandemic and then endured a poor Chinook salmon run and then to top it off, a totally unexpected poor chum salmon run. The poor chum salmon runs were definitely not expected. And if we could go to the next slide, please, number two. Our preseason forecast for fall chum salmon, which was completed in midwinter, was for a run size of 827,000 fish to 1 million fish. And this is what we presented at the spring panel meeting. As you know, fall season managers and research staff have a valuable tool and the relationship between summer chum and fall chum salmon runs that allow us to revise our forecast to an initial preseason projection. This revision was made in early July prior to the beginning of the fall season after we saw how the, the summer chum salmon run developed. And it was clear entering the, 20, the, the fall season that the 2020 run was going to be much lower than what our initial forecast was. Our in-season projection was for a fall chum salmon run of less than 450,000 fish and it was this projection that informed our management approach entering the fall season. If we could go to next slide, please, number three. 
With the end season projection in hand, our management objectives were to endeavor to meet our treaty border objectives for fall chum salmon, which is a escapement objective of 70,000 to 104,000 fish, and also meet our harbor sharing agreement. We also endeavored to meet fall chum salmon sa escapement goals, uh, which are listed there. And as we just talked about with the panel uh, management recommendations, all of our in-season assessment projects operated, it's not listed here, but also to take environmental conditions and consider them in, in season to inform any management decisions regarding harv harvest opportunities. And just as a note to folks, as we know that the Canadian porcupine fall chum salmon will be addressed in a separate presentation. Next slide, please, number four. Fall chum salmon harvest management is guided by the provisions contained within the Yukon River Drainage Fall Chum Salmon Management Plan. The plan contains threshold run size necessities that determine which uses, subsistence and commercial, for example, that can occur. Looking at the chart in front of you, looking at the first row, the 300,000 fish or less, a 300,000 fish run size is required to allow subsistence fishing for fall chum salmon. At run sizes below this threshold, subsistence fishing is closed as well as commercial personal use and sport fishing. Now, if we look at the second row at run sizes between 300,000 and 550,000 fish, subsistence fishing is allowed, but restrictions may be necessary to meet treaty objectives and escapement goals. At run sizes within this range, commercial personal use and sport fishing remain closed. And finally, looking at the third row at run sizes of at least 550,000 fish is needed to allow commercial fishing personal use and sport fishing for fall chum salmon. So based on the in-season projection of less than 450,000 fish, management began the fall season in the middle portion of the plan. Thus, we expected the run to provide an average to below average subsistence harvest with possible restrict fishing restrictions needed to meet our management objectives. In addition, we did not anticipate any commercial harvest unless the in-season run projection exceeded 550,000 fish. Next slide, please, number five. This brings us to our management strategy entering the fall season. One that all districts and sub-districts would be placed on regulatory subsistence fish, uh, fishing schedule to begin the season. A complete closure of subsistence fishing in the Alaska portion of the main stem porcupine river was likely. Commercial fishing, uh, commercial salmon fishing will not be allowed unless the in-season run projection exceeded 550,000 fish. And of course, uh, the, the ability to modify in-season management based on what we were seeing in season uh, in terms of the run. Next slide, number six, please. <clears throat> Before I move into summarizing how this, the run and management uh, progressed in season, I'd like to review the in-season assessment projects that operated in 2020 and considering the issues that were associated with the pandemic, offer thanks to the communities and organizations whose help and cooperation was essential in making them happen and is greatly appreciated. The Lower Yukon Test Fishery located at the Big Eddy and Middle Mouse sites were operated by staff from YDFDA as department staff were not able to be in Amonic because of travel restrictions. We extend our thanks and gratitude to them for operating this project and mentioned that they did an exceptional job in conducting the test fisheries and getting information to department staff. The test fisheries at Mountain Village operated normally as it is run by the Mountain Village Tribal Council and the staff of local fishermen. However, many thanks to them for operating uh, in the midst of many issues and concerns that have, must have been there within their community during the, the pandemic. And thanks to the communities of St. Mary's and Pilot Station for working with department staff to plan a way to operate the sonar while, enduring, uh, while ensuring that individuals and communities as well as sonar staff remain safe. All three projects are vital to the management and in 2020, these projects provided the information managers needed to make informed management decisions. And again, to all the communities and organizations for their plan and making it work. If we find ourselves in this situation next year, we should have a pretty valuable blueprint on how it can work if we need to do it again. Next slide, number seven, please. Okay, let's look at what happened during the season. During the next few slides, I wanna show you what we were seeing in season in terms of run assessment and the management actions that were being implemented. 
we are first going to look at the first quarter of the season. The graph that you see in front of you shows daily passage of chum salmon in the main stem sonar, which are the blue bars, scaled by the left axis, and the cumulative run passage shown in red triangles, which is scaled on the right axis. The thin black line tracks where the cumulative passage needed to be for a 300,000 fish run, and the thick black line tracks where we needed to be for a 550,000 fish run. Recall those two numbers were the thresholds within the management plan that I previously mentioned. During this time frame, the run was tracking closely with, but above the 300,000 fish run line with a surplus for subsistence harvest. At this time, districts one through four were on a regulatory fishing schedule. Also towards the end of this time frame, the first group of fall chum entered and was passing the sonar. Management was monitoring the projection to see how these, this group of fish coming in would change, um, whether our projection would increase. Next slide, number eight, please. Also during this time frame, genetic information became available that allowed us to account for the number of summer chum present in the cumulative count and subtract them out. This graph using the same symbols and scaling as the previous one shows daily and cumulative counts adjusted to show fall chum salmon only. Once the adjustment was made, the cumulative passage was tracking closer to the 300,000 fish run size line, thus reducing the amount of surplus for subsistence use and managers began implementing restrictions that began with half regulatory fishing periods and ended with canceling, canceled subsistence fishing periods. At this time, managers continued to monitor the run, watching for additional pulses that might improve the in-season run projection before allowing any additional subsistence fishing opportunity. Next slide, number nine, please. Now we are looking at the run as it approached the midpoint around the second week of August. Additional groups of fall chum salmon had entered the river, but they were not sufficient in size to improve the in-season run projection, which by August 9th was tracking well below the 300,000 fish threshold that allows subsistence fishing. Also based on genetic information, it was, uh, it was concluded that the treaty objectives and escapement goals would likely not be achieved. By August 12th, managers implemented a full fishing closure for fall chum salmon. Also of a note, because of the fishing restrictions that I previously mentioned, subsistence fishing in the lower river had effectively closed by August 6th. Next slide, number 10, please. During the subsistence fall chum salmon closure, four inch mesh or less gill nets were allowed uh, by, for use by fishermen to target non-salmon species. This occurred in all districts and sub-districts. Selective gear was allowed to target other salmon and non-salmon species in districts one through four, sub-districts 5A and district six uh, where coho salmon were present. We also allowed the use of, of manned fish wheels, uh, the use of dip nets and hook and line gear in all the cases above any fall chum salmon that were caught incidentally were to be released alive immediately. Next slide, number 11, please. Finally, we'll look at the run through September 7th, the end of the run. The in-season run projection never rose above 300,000 fish threshold and fall chum salmon, uh, and all fall chum salmon fishing remained closed for the season. The run was complete by September 8th based on several consecutive days of low numbers or no fish caught in the, in the test fisheries in the lower river and based on historical run timing information. Districts and sub-districts began reopening to subsistence salmon fishing concurrent with, the mag with migratory timing at the beginning, the fall chum migratory timing beginning with the September 8th date at the sonar. I do wanna mention that the tribs and spawning grounds remained closed for the entire season, Cantishna River, tributary of the Tanana, the Chandelar River, and of course the US portion of the Porcupine River. It never opened to subsist, or the porcupine was never open to subsistence fishing for the 2020 season. And next slide, number 12, please. To close out our, the management portion of today's summary, a look at the U.S. harvest of fall chum salmon. This graph shows both commercial harvest, the light blue portions of the bar, and the subsistence harvest, which is the dark blue portion since 2000. 
The black land represents five year averages of both harvests combined. As I mentioned, there was no commercial fishing or test fish sales of salmon during the 2020 fall season. The subsistence harvest of fall chum salmon estimated from the preseason subsistence survey and also from permanent harvest information was approximately 6,200 fish, which is well below the 2015-2019 average harvest of 77,000 fish. <clears throat> I can't stress this enough and, and endless thanks go to the fishermen, subsistence and commercial, personal use and sport for their sacrifices in helping conserve fall chum this year. The extreme hardships concurred by all user groups in all areas of the river with the poor salmon runs on top of the complexities that the pandemic has presented is definitely recognized by all managers and staff and can assure you it's something that's not lost upon us. Now I'll pass it over to Bonnie Borba who will summarize the postseason assessment and give a summary of the coho salmon season. Next slide number 13 please. Good morning, my name is Bonnie Borva. I'm the fall season research biologist with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game Division of Commercial Fisheries based out of Fairbanks. I'm gonna to talk to you about the results from the assessment projects in 2020. Slide 14, please. This chart is a summary of the ASL data collected from the Lower Yukon Test Fish Project. The averages are represented in the light bars on the right and the 2020 is the dark bars on the left of each pair of data. The first thing we noticed during the summer season was the poor showing of age four chum salmon. We checked with the other area biologists and they were observing the same thing. We anxiously awaited to see what the fall run was, would look like since fall chum salmon are usually dominated by age four fish by 70%. At the end of the season, proportions were nearly 50-50 between the age fours and age fives with a below average age four return. The sex ratio was near average. And the other interesting information was that the chum salmon of all age classes were larger than average as seen in the bar on the far right. Slide 15, please. The groupings in this map are the genetic stocks we commonly refer to. The border US stock, Trojinjik, Sheenjik, and Dronjik is in the upper left oval. The fishing branch river stock, which are unique, but we are unable to sample in proportion to the run are in the small upper right oval. The main stem Yukon River into the upper Canada is the largest and most right oval. And the fall component of the Tanana River stocks, which also has a summer component that overlaps is in the median lower left oval. Slide 16, please. This chart is of the genetic groupings and they're in the order of the stocks they as they typically enter the river with the border US slightly earlier than the Canadian main stem stocks and the Tanana stocks coming in last as they build throughout the season. The right bars are the average and the left dark bars are the 2020. The results for 2020 was a different distribution than usual with the upper Yukon stocks, both border US and mainstream Canada coming in lower than average and the Tanana River Fall stocks coming in higher than average. Slide 17, please. The rightmost bars in this chart show the median passage at the normal escapement monitoring projects compared to the leftmost light bars, which is 2000, the previous worst run. The dark bars in the middle are the escapement for 2020. The pairs of horizontal lines over the bars indicate, indicate the current escapement goal ranges for each of the areas. The Trojinjik River was not monitored this season due to COVID. Both Canadian systems did not achieve their IMEGs. Note that the Fishing Branch River was near the same escapement as 2000. However, the main stem Yukon River was nearly half the escapement of 2000. The Delta River, a tributary of the Tanana River, achieved its goal in 2020 with an escapement three times that of 2000. Achieving the goal was likely partially due to the distribution of stocks this season as described in the previous slide. Slide 18, please. This slide contains some additional points about the run this year. As stated earlier, the weak return of age four salmon was not just the Yukon River, 
but all of Western Alaska salmon stocks. We are not sure what caused the disparity of the upper Yukon versus Tanana River stocks as both the US and Canadian stocks should have experienced similar marine environments. This was also the first year of the age four return from the Kluani River system since the glacier had receded, but we need more years of escapement data to evaluate if the system cannot support normal production. Slide 19, please. This chart shows the total drainage wide fall chum salmon run size in bars. The dark portion of the bars represent the drainage wide escapement and the light portion of the bars represent estimated harvest. Harvest includes fisheries in both Alaska and Canada. The important subsistence information is provided by families in the Yukon area participating in the annual voluntary harvest survey project along with subsistence fishing permit data. The solid lines represent the drainage wide escapement goal range and previous historical escapement objectives. In 2020, the lower end of the goal was not achieved in the first time for the first time in 19 years. Note in the years from 1974 to 1992 outlined in the bottom bracket, there was an even odd cycle with large returns over a million fish occurring in odd numbered years. After that, the pattern of returns has changed into larger cycles of high returns as indicated by the four small brackets on the bottom right. Slide 20, please. As I illustrated on the previous slide, the swings in production have changed. In reference to the low years, we see examples in the historical data set where production was possibly influenced by freshwater environment in January of 1989 when a 16 day extreme low temperature event occurred that likely contributed to low returns of age four and age five. Or for those, those years later that would, they would have returned in 92 and 93. During this event, the Tanana, in Tanana, a record of 76 degrees Fahrenheit below was set. And you can imagine the cold temperatures on the Porcupine River and in the Yukon Flats where some of the fall chum salmon spawn. The early 2000s decline was thought to be marine effects, some of which included the extended coccolithophore blooms that lasted three years. And 2020 appears to be marine as well, since it was very widespread as discussed earlier and was possibly affected by the Bering Sea and Gulf of Alaska heat wave of 2016. A warm pool of water in the ocean termed the blob was persisted, it persisted from 2014, 15 and into 2016. Each low run has rebounded, partly thanks to the life history trait of salmon to spread their returns over multiple years, chum salmon returning in age four and age five. Slide 21, please. Marine work by NOAA and Alaska Department of Fish and Game looking at marine ecology of Western Alaska juvenile salmon is finally getting enough years of data to begin modeling. We are currently working on developing a juvenile index of abundance that hopefully relates to the adult returns of fall chum salmon. Do high juvenile abundance correspond to high fall chum salmon adult returns? Preliminary information from the juvenile data shows a decrease in juvenile abundance compared to the previous seven years, which appeared to hold true with the dismal 2020 adult returns. The index shows an above average juvenile abundance for the next two years which might be a sign of improvements after this past year, but until all the age classes return, the information remains unconfirmed. We hope the abundance index will provide us with the tool in our management toolbox, useful for forecasting future returns of chum salmon, similar to the Chinook Salmon Juvenile Abundance Index. We will keep you posted on this as this research advances. Now for a summary of coho salmon in 2020, slide 22, please. The index of coho salmon run size was estimated to be 121,000 fish, fish, which is below the average of 239,000. Since coho salmon run timing greatly overlaps that with fall chum salmon and they are similar sized fish, management affects both species. In 2020, preliminary coho salmon harvest is a record low of 2,900 fish. Even with selective fishing opportunities, this season created extreme hardship for families. The Delta Clearwater Escapement Goal 
was not achieved. Slide 23, please. I'd like to thank all these folks for assisting with the projects that helped us manage the fishery in 2020. And slide 24 is the last slide. That's our contact information. And I believe questions will be after we do the, the Canadian version. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bonnie and, and Jeff for the presentation. And we will move into the Canadian 2020 main stem chum salmon postseason presentation. And that will then be followed by panel member, the opportunity for panel member questions on both the United States and the Canadian presentations. Uh, so for agenda item number three, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Oliver Barker and Ms. Jesse Treris uh, from Fisheries Canada to provide the 2020 on River Main Stem uh, Chum Salmon postseason uh, report for Canada. Good morning, Yukon River panel co-chairs, panel members, alternates, and advisors. My name is Jesse Treris, and I am the Yukon River Fishery Manager with Fisheries and Oceans Canada, uh, based in Whitehorse, Yukon. Yeah, there today with my colleague, Oliver Barker, who is the Senior Biologist for Fisheries and Oceans Canada's Yukon River Operations. Uh, we will be providing the Canadian postseason review of Yukon River main stem chum salmon for the 2020 season. And uh, just for the benefit of uh, members of public who may be watching um, or others who are not uh, as frequently involved with these uh, meetings and recognizing how acronym heavy uh, these presentations can be, uh, just please note that Fisheries and Oceans Canada is also referred to as DFO. Thank you. Uh, slide number two, please. So over the course of our presentation, I'll present a review of the preseason recommendations that are relevant to chum management. Um, those were the recommendations that the panel had provided in April. And similar to yesterday's Chinook presentation, I will also briefly describe how those were incorporated into Canadian management for 2020. And Oliver and I will jointly present a time series of Canadian origin river chum assessment and associated management. Uh, this will be followed with Oliver providing a post-season summary of assessment projects. And finally, an overview of the environmental conditions in the Canadian portion of the Yukon River watershed. Slide number three, please. So, uh, as before, uh, I'll follow the fish upriver on the Yukon River main stem. Uh, and we'll start with the preseason forecast, which is developed while the fish are still in the ocean, uh, and then move to in-season projections. These are developed first developed once the summer chum run is in the lower in the lower river is nearly complete, and then uh, again when the first fall chum are entering the river. Early season management, we'll look at pilot station numbers, and for in-season adjustment and border passage, we'll look at eagle sonar. Slide four, please. So as we know, the Yukon River panel had provided four management recommendations in April for the 2020 season. Um, and so I'm going to be providing a review of the three recommendations which had management implications for chum fisheries in Canada, uh, which started with the second recommendation, which was to provide for Canadian origin Chinook salmon conservation to limit the use of gill nets to six inch mesh or smaller upstream of the Tanana Yukon River confluence for the duration of the Chinook salmon migration consistent with the regulatory structures in both countries. Slide number five, please. The third management recommendation was to consider environmental conditions, particularly extreme events, to inform management measures implemented and resulting harvest opportunities. 
And finally, the fourth recommendation was that in the event that in-season assessment programs were unable to operate, uh, that fishery harvest opportunities should be provided conservatively based on the 2020 preseason outlooks and associated total allowable catch and harvest share allocations. So over the next three slides, I'll briefly describe how DFO implemented the Yukon River Panel's management recommendations into Canadian chum fishery management. Slide number six, please. So with respect to the second management recommendation, which was to consider use of six inch or smaller mesh gill nets upstream of the Tanana River, Yukon River main stem confluence for the duration of the Chinook salmon run, uh, this recommendation was incorporated into Canadian management uh, by way of including this as a condition of license in both the commercial and domestic chum salmon fisheries. And those licensing conditions uh, did clearly articulate that gill nets were be to be a maximum of six inches during the period from July 1st through to October 25th, 2020, which is the duration of the Chinook salmon run. Slide number seven, please. With respect to the third recommendation, to consider environmental conditions, particularly extreme events, to inform in-season fishery management and harvest opportunities, uh, well, DFO monitored water temperature and water levels in numerous areas in the Canadian portion of the Yukon River watershed. And that in-season data about water temperature and flow, it didn't indicate that uh, either would pose a substantial threat to the survival of any migrating adult chum in Canada. And so as a result, uh, that didn't, did not warrant uh, management actions to change or further limit harvest opportunities in Canada. Slide number eight, please. So with respect to the fourth recommendation, which considered the possibility that in-season assessment programs might not be able to operate uh, and that the recommended fishery harvest opportunities be provided conservatively and based on 2020 outlooks, I would say that this approach already aligns well within the Canadian fishery management philosophy of taking a precautionary approach. Um, uh, but however, and fortunately, uh, both pilot and eagle projects were operational uh, throughout the 2020 season. And uh, once again, um, a big uh, round of thank you and kudos to all those who made that happen. Uh, pictured on slide number eight uh, is the front cover of this year's management plan, which outlines the management strategy for the season. And so this strategy did articulate this this particular recommendation and the others uh, and how to implement it. Slide number nine, please. And so similarly to yesterday's Chinook presentation, uh, this slide, slide number nine, will start the chronological reporting of management and assessment of Canadian origin chum during the 2020 season. Essentially, this is a time series overview of the assessment information that was available at the time. Um, also, the management expectations and activities underway, and of course, the implementation of the Canadian fisheries management strategy. On this particular slide, we have an overview of the Yukon River Chum management in April through May of 2020. Uh, this is taking us back to the information that we had pre-season, which pre-season there was an outlook for 207,000 to 261,000 Canadian origin Yukon River main stem chum salmon. And as a reminder, the Yukon River chum interim management escapement goal, or IMEG, is 70,000 to 104,000. And so based on this pre-season outlook, the IMEG and harvest sharing provisions, the total allowable harvest share was estimated at around 103,000 to 191,000. And of that, the Canadian harvest share was estimated to be 33,000 to 68,000. 
In this information, the Canadian fishery expectations were that there was indeed an allocation available to Canadian fisheries and that there would be harvest opportunities in the four Canadian fisheries, which include the First Nations subsistence fishery, commercial, domestic, and public angling fisheries. During this time, DFO was also involved in a number of management planning and engagement activities. And although there wasn't a bilateral Yukon River panel meeting, we did participate in the preseason Canadian section meetings where the preseason information and international joint statement were provided. We also hosted virtual meetings with Yukon First Nation governments, the Yukon Salmon Subcommittee, and stakeholders. Slide number 10, please. So slide 10 provides a management overview as of July 14th. At this time, the preseason outlook has been revised to around 121,500 Canadian origin main stem. Um, the expected minimum border passage with this was estimated at around 86,500. And the Canadian allocation was revised to around 16,500 chum. Small chum obviously had not uh, started at pilot as of yet. Uh, and DFO management activities at this time, including sharing the revised forecast with First Nation governments, um, we anticipated allocations in the commercial, domestic, and public angling fisheries, and we also issued conditions of license in the commercial and domestic chum fisheries, which included um, a condition that all incidentally caught Chinook must be released, and also that the maximum allowable uh, mesh size would be uh, is six inches. Slide 11, please. Like for the Chinook presentation, I've got a uh, daily passage here from Pilot Station, uh, earlier part of the run. Uh, the orange bars here are main stem Canadian origin chum estimates. And those are determined using genetic testing. Light gray bars are total fall chum, and that includes U.S. origin and Canadian porcupine origin chum. And the dashed line is the average daily passage of main stem Canadian origin chum. So that's, that's what we're focusing on for this presentation. As the pilot station counts began and the genetics uh, were coming in, it was clear that the, the fall chum run this year was going to be historically low. Uh, main stem Canadian origin chum estimates were well below the average. Slide 12. Slide 12 provides a management overview as of August 10th. And so by this point, there has been an in-season revision to the projected run size, which estimated that the Canadian run size would be less than, less than 75,000 fish. So with this, the expected fishery allocation to Canada was greatly reduced to less than 1,600 mainstem Yukon River chum, and the minimum expected border passage was expected to be around 71,600 uh, fish. Well, sonar has not started counting chum as of yet, um, and with this in-season information, DFO is not anticipating that there will actually be an allocation to Canadian fisheries and proceeds to close, we proceeded to close the commercial, domestic, and public angling fisheries prior to the season. And number 13, please. Back at pilot station, um, by mid-August, there, no there was no sign of an increase. Uh, the run was starting low and looked like it would stay low. Slide 14. Slide 14 presents a management snapshot as of the 18th of August. So by this point, the in-season projected Canadian run size is estimated for a run of fewer than 62,500 chum. Pilot station passage of Canadian origin chum is around 22,000 fish, and the border passage is expected to be less than 62,500 chum. 
Eagle has counted zero chum, and in consideration of the updated projection, DFO confirmed with harvesters that abundance would not provide for an allocation to Canadian fisheries, and furthermore, that the spawning escapement goal was unlikely to be achieved, even in the absence of uh, any harvest or, or removals. So at this point, uh, DFO management actions included maintaining the angling, commercial, and domestic fishery closures. And we also hosted an in-season meeting with commercial license holders on August 19th. Slide 15, please. These are the final numbers from Pilot Station, and they showed a historically low passage. Uh, at 31,000, the main stem Canadian Canadian origin uh, chum passage estimate was only 13% of the 15-year average. Slide 16. By mid-September, uh, fish had begun passing eagle sonar as well, but it was clear that the numbers, the estimates there would also be historically low, um, was expected based on pilot numbers. Slide 17. Here we have a management overview as of September 10th. The in-season information we have at this point includes a revised run size projection of fewer than 47,250 Canadian origin Yukon River chum. Pilots still counting chum with an estimated uh, Canadian origin pilot passage of around 30,400 fish, and eagle sonar passage is estimated at around 3,600. So in consideration of the in-season projections of the Canadian origin chum run, all indications based on in-season information from pilot point to zero harvest allocations to either the U.S. or Canada, and that the abundance is below the level required to meet the escapement goal. So with this information, DFO extends the public angling closure for the duration of the chum salmon season. Slide number 18, please. So slide number 18 provides a management overview as of September 24th. At this point, an estimated 30,400 Canadian origin chum have passed pilot sonar. And Eagle Sonar has estimated around 12,460 chum to have passed. Given the run timing and abundance at Eagle, we're not anticipating a border passage more than 23,000 at this point. And it's obvious that the abundance at Pilot, let alone what Eagle Sonar was showing us, uh, would be, su would be um, insufficient to meet even the lower bound of the IMAG range, which just as a reminder is 70,000 to 140,000. And with that information, uh, it was quite likely and apparent that there would be no harvest allocation to Canadian fisheries as per the Pacific Salmon Treaty Chapter 8 or the Yukon River Salmon Agreement. Slide number 19, please. This is total passage at Eagle at the end of the run. Uh, like at Pilot, the final Eagle estimate uh, for the year was very low. Uh, just over 23,000, it was 12% of the average run at Eagle. Slide 20. So slide 20 provides a written summary of chum salmon fishery management actions. Uh, for the stocks on the Yukon River main stem in Canada during the 2020 season. So with respect to Fisheries and Oceans Canada, or DFO, uh, chum salmon management, DFO uh, closed both the commercial and domestic fisheries for the duration of the season. We prohibited the retention of chum in the public angling fishery on the Yukon River and its tributaries from September 11th through November 30th. We also shared updated information on in-season abundance via in-season conference calls and virtual meetings. A point uh, that I didn't make on this slide or any of the previous slides was that DFO was also uh, continuing on with the interagency meetings 
uh, with the fall season ADF and G staff. Um, and with respect to Yukon First Nation government fishery management actions, uh, First Nation governments did engage with First Nation citizens and recommended avoiding chum harvest. They also considered in-season information and updates, which included the recommendations from the Yukon Salmon Subcommittee to conserve chum salmon and to stop harvest of chum salmon. Sorry, slide 21, please. Uh, so slide 21 provides a post-season report card of the Canadian Origin Yukon River Chum Run. Uh, this also includes the harvest and escapement outcomes. Here we see that the total Canadian Origin estimated run size is around 25,000. The associated harvest shares for the U.S. with this is zero. Uh, the U.S. harvest is estimated at around 1,500 fish. The border objective was uh, about 25,000 chum. The border passage is estimated at 23,512. And the Canadian harvest share is zero. The Canadian harvest is estimated at zero. And spawning escapement is estimated at 23,512. So in summary, the total Canadian run size was insufficient to meet the bottom end of the escapement goal range of 70,000 to 100,000. Uh, there were no Pacific Salmon Treaty Chapter 8 fishery allocations available to either the U.S. or Canada. And finally, unfortunately, spawning escapement did not meet the interim management escapement goal or IMEG. Uh, slide 22, please. Let's return to Eagle Sonar as an estimate of chum crossing the border into Canada. Uh, there was no reported U.S. harvest between Eagle and the border this year. Uh, the Eagle estimate is also the border passage estimate. So I'll go and go back and look at these numbers compared to past results. Slide 23. Border passage this year was the lowest on record at 23,512. That's well below both the long-term and 10-year averages. Slide 24. The total estimated run size was also the lowest on record at 25,000. And as a reminder, the total estimated run size is the combined total of the estimated eagle and estimated downstream harvest of main stem Canadian origin chum. Slide 25. Spawning escapement was also the lowest on record, uh, and this is the first year since 2001 that the main stem chum spawning escapement goal was not met. Uh, goal here shown by the black bars. Slide 26. Look at harvest as well, uh, with U.S. harvest in gray and Canadian harvest in black, spawning escapement in orange. Uh, year's harvest in the U.S. was small and was zero in Canada. Or harvest would not have made up the difference between spawning escapement and the escapement goal range this year. Slide 27. You can also look at age, sex, and length of fish entering Canada using Eagle data. Um, a reminder again, the majority of Yukon River fall chum return as four-year-olds, with the remainder of the run usually made up of five-year-olds. Uh, honors of other, age, of other ages are rare. This year, however, there were considerably few, fewer age four fish at Eagle than, than usual. Uh, that's consistent with results in the lower river and across Alaska for chum in 2020. Those are fish from the 2016 brood year. Those, those four-year-olds, they simply didn't return in expected numbers. Slide 28. Also look at the male to female ratio this year. Um, Year's run at Eagle was 46% female, which is the highest on record at Eagle. Factoring in run size, though, the total number of females past Eagle, Eagle was still the lowest on record. Slide 29. Finally, looking at the size of male and female fish separately and comparing them to past sizes, 
male fish were smaller than average this year. They were similar in size to uh, those in 2009 and last year. Female fish, though, were of average size. Slide 30. We we'll also go back and look at a comparison between pilot station and eagle sonar for this year, as we did for Chinook. Uh, unlike for Chinook, the pilot estimate was reasonably close to the eagle estimate. Uh, the sonar passage was at the low end of the 90% confidence, in, confidence interval of the pilot station sonar count. Slide 31. We can add in U.S. harvest of Canadian origin uh, chum downstream of eagle. That's in gray there. Overall, this shows the number of fish reaching eagle sonar combined with harvest was similar to what was predicted from pilot station numbers this year. Slide 32. Finally, I'll review environmental conditions encountered by migrating and spawning adult chum in Canada. Water levels were higher on average through mid-October uh, before dropping back to average levels. Note that uh, we spoke a little bit about Kalwani Lake. Those levels remain about a meter below the long-term average. And that's following diversion of uh, a major headwater through glacial retreat and redirection south to the ALSEC drainage. Water temperatures for the chum migration and spawning period are, are typically not available until later in the year, often when, when Al retrieves his loggers. Water temperatures through this period are typically cool, um, have that same chance of harmfully warm water that exists during the Chinook migration. Slide 33. That all will, uh, I'll turn back to the co-chairs. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Oliver and uh, Jesse, for the presentation. So uh, this leads us to uh, questions from Yukon River panel members, uh, and we will start uh, with U.S. panel member Andy Bassich, uh, go ahead. Yeah, thank thank you very much, uh, Mr. Curry Chair. Uh, Tom Alb, can you pull up on the Al the Alaskan uh, presentation? I believe it's slide 15. Uh, Mr. Co-Chair, I have a number of different questions here, probably three to four. If you bear with me here, I'll make them pretty quick. Um, the first thing I'd uh, like to ask is if someone could remind me what the, the normal percent of Canadian chum salmon is compared to the U.S. Um, chum salmon run, uh, just so we have that perspective, because a number of those graphs showed a, a very large uh, difference between Canadian stocks and, and um, U, uh, U.S. stocks for fall chum. So could someone give me that percent, please? On the average, Ronnie, you want to tackle that, or you want me to go for it, Jeff? Yeah, Andy. So typically, you know, when we're looking at uh, the distribution of the main stocks, right there for the Canadian main stem, uh, looking over the years, it's about twenty-five percent of the run over over the years. Um, kind of a back of the envelope. Bonnie can uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that or add any more to it, but uh, about 25% of the run overall. All right, thank you very much. And then um, if uh, Oliver or Al Von Finster, if you're on board there, if you could give me some kind of an estimation of what the percent of fall chum that normally would be utilizing the lake system, uh, Kalani Lake system, habitat that we may have lost or had impacts to. Do you have any numbers on what the percent of fall chum that would normally use that habitat is? Yes. Um, so looking at numbers from before 2016, uh, comparing Kluwani aerial counts to uh, total escapement of main stem chum, that average is 11%. So if there were, okay. yeah, 11%. Thank you. Um, I guess the one question that I'd like, one more question I'd like to ask is, um, you know, for years I've been bringing up the issues of potential overescapement of fall chum into Canada and those negative impacts uh, due to the, the very specific rearing needs for, for spawning 
survival for fall chum. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that, because when we see, when I look at some of these charts that you've put up and we changed over from that even odd year, what we've ended up doing is having three to four years of very high escapements followed by a drop, uh, a fairly severe drop. So I'm wondering if you've had any discussions or thoughts or, or maybe possibly uh, try and determine that. It's a, it's a concern that I brought up for a number of years. And so I'm just wondering if you could share a few thoughts on, on that possibility. And the reason why I'm saying that is um, these slides that show um, the US stocks in comparison. Now, I, I believe that a lot of what's going on is marine driven for this failure, but if the US stocks are not showing the same impacts as the Canadian stocks, then that would point the finger that there are some issues with the Canadian stocks, whether it's habitat related or over escapement related. Uh, those are two possible factors. So I was wondering if maybe you could address that uh, as to what some of your thoughts might be on that difference. Uh, I can, and maybe I can that's to you, Oliver. That's directed to me. Uh, a lot of our discussion this year has uh, about um, missing or, or, or unexpectedly low return of the 2016 uh, year, year class has to do with the marine environment, um, given the the scope of that, uh, of that, that, that issue, you know, not simply Yukon River, not simply Canadian uh, portion of the Yukon River, but across the coast. Um, we have been speaking specifically to the, the, the questions around, about habitat in Kluwani Lake and Kluwani River. Um, it, as, as mentioned, it's still quite early to know exactly what to expect. If there are changes in Kluwani River, that would uh, reduce its ability to, to support fish. Um, I would say that the proportion of the Kluwani River stock uh, as part of the larger main stem uh, stock wouldn't, even if there were zero fish, which there were not this year, would be insufficient to, to, um, to explain low return to Canada. I think a lot of what we're seeing as well in proportion, you know, the, the low proportion of Canadian origin fish in the overall run this year has to do uh, with higher than, than anticipated proportion of um, Canada fish. Whether that is directly attributable to overescapement or something along those lines uh, is much less clear um, given the information we have. Certainly something that we, we have spoken on a bit and will continue to look at. Um, not, um, not something that presents an obvious smoking gun, let me say that. Thank, thank you, Oliver. Um, and, and maybe if Al von Pfister is on board here, I have a question for him. Um, and I guess the only other question I would have for you is in that Kalani Lake system, would the absence or the decline in the level of waters affect the uh, underground stream flows that are so important to um, the upwelling that's so important to fall chum habitat spawning ground? So I'm just wondering if maybe some of the reduced water flows in that region might be also be affecting spawning grounds on a much larger uh, scale than we may observe from just the surface. So that's something to think about. And a question for possibly you or Al, whoever could answer it is, uh, can you address the long-term winter spawning habitat uh, environment over the past, say, 10, 10 years um, due to climate change? Are we getting colder? Are we getting water warmer? Uh, and also winter flow, which is so important to those fall chum eggs. Uh, are we seeing any kind of a substantial change or even if it's a low um, steady change, if you could give me any of that information, if you have any of that, I don't know if you would have any of that, but I trust Mr. Von Finster is <laughs> probably on top of that. Thank you. And that, that's my final question. Thank you, Mr. Kocher.
Yeah, I was just waiting for for your your um, to complete your question. I guess there's two things here. One is the um, population in Kalani Lake, and I want to I want to stress that that's not a very large uh, population. The main spawning area is in a section of the Kalani River, and uh, it it basically starts from a place just upstream of a place at Quill Creek and then goes down to a place called Salmon Patch. One of the, the difficulties of the Kluwani River is that um, there is a, well, there's actually a series of bridges of bedrock upstream so that the level of the lake really doesn't modify the level of the water that's in the drainage basin as long as the, the um, as, they're long, as long as they're being fed by the glaciers. And I wanted to raise that because this year, the, a big chunk of the water that came off the glacier went back into Kuwani Lake. The glacier moves forward in the wintertime, and what it does, it, it's going to, it, it has this year, it's probably going to do it in the future, but it has the ability to dam off the uh, flow of water into Kuwani Lake and to raise the level of the lake into the fall, and I think that's what we're seeing right now. Uh, Oliver gave a, a, a number of about a, a meter, and the lake would normally be farther down. But then when you follow the, the and I'm talking this just on the Kauai River here, I'm not including the Yukon River main stem and the Minto area, which is another big concentration of the spawning fish. But the Kauai River gets its water from it's called hyperreic flow. So water enters the riverbed, flows through the riverbed, and in so doing, it, it um, warms the rocks underneath. And then the rocks underneath basically radiate the, the heat out, and it warms the water during the, the winter time. The problem that we've got now, is, though, is that the water itself in the river isn't high enough. So the amount of spawning habitat that's available is becoming less and less. And unfortunately, even though I've gone to the Kiwani River for most falls over, and a lot of springs too, over the last, um, I think it's about 36 years now, uh, unless you can get up above in a helicopter, you really can't see the full scale of the spawning site. So I can go there and I can go to the, the spawning sites on the right side of the river looking downstream, I can walk through them, I can see where the juveniles come out, um, you know, in the springtime, and I have some measure of how well uh, I think the river is, is doing, but that doesn't give me access to salmon patch over on the other side, so it, it's a bit limited. But in answer to your first question, um, Andy, the, the uh, when you have the really big returns, the returns of you know 450,000 a year into, into Canada, something like that, the spawning areas are overwhelmed. So when you walk through it, you see lots and lots in the fall time, you see lots and lots, lots of uh, eggs in the gravel that have been dug out by the fish. So that's clearly a period when the you have an excess of spawning in it, and it probably cuts down in the uh, number of fish which are produced because two things. One is that there's too many juveniles emerging and eating uh, the available um, food, fish food organisms, the adventix and vertebrates at that period of time. And then on top of that, you have all the eggs which are destroyed or, or uh, had been um, disturbed during the period that when the spawning actually took place. But for most years, when you're looking at, uh, at more, what I want to say, more normal escapements, there is very little uh, evidence of that. You just don't see the eggs on the top. Once the river, uh, once the 2016 diversion happened, the river got a lot smaller. And by smaller, I mean it, was, it wasn't as wide. Uh, a lot of the spawning areas uh, had basically been abandoned. And that's when you started seeing the eggs again. Um, even though the number of fish weren't all that high, the amount of habitat wasn't all that high. The other area, and I, I said I couldn't speak to it, but I just want to mention it, is the Minto area. 
and that basically runs from about Tatchin Creek, and then it runs down to somewhere around Fort Selkirk. And that's a, a larger area, and that area is quite stable because what it is, it's the, very, it's the end of the run out of the rivers that drain the glaciers at the final advance. So what you have are these, these wonderfully um, uh, permeable uh, river bottoms made up of gravel and sands and, and uh, cobbles that just allow the water to flow right through. And those, I think, are stable. I don't think they've been affected very much by the, the changes in, in uh, water up and down. Um, I've certainly heard in, nothing about it from any of the people who live down there who have used it. However, the Kalani River, as we found, and to my great disappointment because I, I really, um, it was a valuable place for me just because it had so much life in it, it's, it's going to fade away, not completely, but it's going to have a lot less in it than it had in the past. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Co-Chair, one quick other comment, if I may. Um, looking at the long-term runs of Fall Chum, I, I would like to put out a request if, if any research or any um, traditional knowledge is out there on uh, a period of time in the early 60s. It seems like in, the, in 2000, we had a major crash. In 2020, we had a major crash. I'm wondering if we can start looking back towards, you know, the 70s, 80s, and 60s to see if there were any similar crash, crashes in that 20-year uh, time frame, um, just to see if there is some sort of a long-term cyclic uh, action that, that's not within our, our um, immediate uh, thought. So that was my only other request, if, if uh, the First Nations people have any traditional knowledge or if DFO has any information on uh, long-term crashes. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Thank you uh, for your questions and, and comments, Andy. Uh, we have another question from U.S. panel member Ragnar Alstrom. Go ahead. So, um, Mr. Chairman, this uh, question is for Ms. Bonnie Borba, and it regards slide 21 of the Alaskan presentation. In, in there, she makes a number of points that they're developing a, a fault sum index, juvenile index, along the lines of the Snook index they do in the in the marine waters uh, prowls they do in the uh, the, the um, in the northern Bering Sea. She makes a couple of points in there. Uh, one is that the return of 2020 juveniles, and I assume the 2016 trial surveys, was lower than the previous seven years. She makes another point that uh, the following two years, so it's 1718, I believe, maybe wrong there, had shown an above average uh, juvenile abundance index. So my question to Ms. Borb is based on knowing that, uh, realizing, I realize there's no uh, 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 juvenile faults on index of abundance, but putting that aside, looking at the the the, uh, the uh, following two years, uh, so it would be returns of 2021 and 2022. Looking at the juvenile in abundant abundance index in marine waters, uh, there there may be cause for hope. Uh, is is that a a a, uh, a good way of putting it? Do I read this? this do, I, do I read your two points correctly? Yeah, the um, the numbers that we have so far goes back to well, they're a year off from um, when the the fish that they're actually sampling. So the years are a little bit they're one different than what you're talking about. But the returns that we're talking about, yeah, seventeen was the lowest in what we do have back to 2003, but we're not using 2008, and there's some concern and stuff we data we still got to work out on 2009. And it looks like the next the following year is about double what it was for this last year, and 2019 is quite a bit higher than either of those years. 
So um, they sh the fish should bounce back, but this index, I mean, we still have a lot of work to do on it and it's not, they're not related to the, yet to adult returns very much. And we, we need more years of data, like we said. So um, we're hoping that, you know, if, if this is showing true, that they are, I'm just telling you that they're both showing much higher than last year. So if, if the index works, that's a good thing, yes. And it would be that, the, that there would be more fish available or returning if the index actually works, which we don't know yet. Okay, thank you. Mr. Co-Chair, if I may, I'd like to add a little bit to that same topic. Um, so it's a really good, um, what you captured, Ragnar and, and Bonnie's explanation. Yes, um, that may indicate um, seeing a rebound uh, as soon as next year. A couple things to bear in mind, Bonnie mentioned that this is very new work, um, the, the index for uh, chum salmon in general from the marine research program is still being developed. Um, but just so folks understand, there is the ability to genetically differentiate fall chum from that um, research and those trawl surveys that are done uh, because they are so genetically distinct, but the overall abundance of, of uh, chum salmon that are uh, taken in that, in that research and evaluated um, is uh, summer chum uh, when it comes to Yukon, but chum salmon from throughout uh, Western Alaska and even some stocks um, from uh, other portions of Alaska that come up into the Bering Sea um, from uh, other chum stocks throughout the North Pacific um, to a large extent. Also bear in mind that um, a, a large portion of, of uh, chum salmon that go into the Bering Sea are also Asian stocks. They come from the other side, uh, from Russia, from Japan, et cetera. Um, so um, there's a lot more evaluation and work that needs to be done with respect to that research program. It's an excellent step in a very good direction of taking advantage of uh, data that's been collected since the inception of that program and samples that have been collected since the inception of that program. Um, and it's excellent that uh, we're all taking advantage of that um, for other species besides Chinook salmon. Um, so uh, we should definitely be waiting to see uh, what additional results may come from that research, but also just the general uh, forecasting process that um, both uh, Alaskan and Canadian researchers go through uh, and the JTC produces um, on an annual basis. So um, the point that Ragnar is bringing up is valid, um, and, um, but we want to be somewhat cautious um, of how much stock um, and reliance that we place upon uh, this emerging marine research. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, I'm cognizant of our schedule and our time. So what we will do is we will take a, a break, but after our break, we will resume with panel member questions uh, on main stem fall chum salmon. I know we have a number of, of panel members who would still like to ask questions uh, on the, uh, the presentations provided this morning. So we will take a break and we will resume in bilateral session with additional questions from panel members on Main Stem Chum at half past the hour. Uh, thank you. Hey, uh, Mr. Co-Chair, are we, uh, I believe we're just at half past the hour, so are we uh, prepared to proceed with uh, the second portion of our more morning bilateral panel meeting? Yes, Mr. Co-Chair, I guess uh, certainly recognizing um, that if uh, Tim and Dennis are back on since they are the next in line for questions on Bald Chum. Mr. Co-Chair, uh, so with that, uh, perhaps we will check with uh, Canadian panel member Tim Gerberding uh, for questions on the Main Stem Chum Salmon 2020 presentations. Uh, go ahead, Tim. Well, thank you, co-chairs. And um, yeah, I'd like to ask a couple of questions that I guess follow the theme of, uh, you know, as human beings, we do what we can to manage these salmon runs, recognizing that uh, acts of God are beyond our control and that, uh, you know, we 
no matter what we did, the 2020 Chum run probably would have been bad. So I hope my questions uh, don't seem nitpicky, but uh, I'd like to just follow up on a couple things that were described in slide number 10 of the Alaska presentation. And this stuff, um, you know, addresses, uh, I guess you could say, uh, selective gear that was allowed to target other salmon or other salmon and non salmon species, and specifically uh, four inch mesh gill nets and manned fish wheels. And, and, and I guess that, um, you know, when it comes to four inch mesh gill nets, I'm wondering, you know, whether there was any requirement, for example, that they be manned or that they be checked at periodic intervals, uh, you know, whether they were allowed to be left in the water overnight. And, and if there's any sense of how much chum salmon might have been caught incidentally uh, in those four inch mesh nets. And the very same question for uh, fish wheels. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, did those fish wheels have to have live boxes, that is underwater boxes? Uh, were they allowed to operate overnight? Uh, and I guess that to put the question more generally, uh, I mean, were there additional steps taken to ensure that these uh, nets and fish wheels that were targeting non-chum salmon uh, were in fact operated in such a way as to really minimize the chum salmon harvest? Thank you for that. Mr. Chair, this is uh, Mr. Co-Chair, this is uh, Jeff Essens, and I, I will be more than happy to answer that question. Um, the first part of the question was the with the four inch mesh or less gill nets, were they required to be manned? Uh, no, they weren't. Um, and check periodically was up to the fishermen as how often they wanted to check it. With the implementation of the four inch mesh or less, um, the reason why that was done was, uh, you know, especially considering, you know, the, the, you know, the restrictions that were taken during the summer season and this unexpected fall season, and obviously the closure that occurred, um, we wanted to try to give fishermen as much opportunity as possible on the U.S. side to try to get some sort of other species of fish, whether it was uh, other salmon that they were present, such as coho, or in this case with the four inch mesh, non-salmon non species, whitefish, pike, or whatever. Um, certainly well aware of the, the, the opportunity for this gear to be either misused or, you know, operated. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Member Rockler. Um, I think, in, first off, it's important to keep in mind that there are two different things here. Is that for me? Uh, no, apologies for that, uh, Jeff. Uh, we had a, a line, uh, an open line. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, okay. Sorry. Apologize. At any rate, there was certainly, it was well aware of the opportunity that that could be used in a way that would, uh, you know, target chum salmon or, you know, result in a, in a large harvest of chum salmon. I think that, you know, in terms of it being used in a way it wasn't supposed to, we definitely had enforcement, our Alaska wildlife troopers that were on the river that we communicated with, and we do that in season. I'm well aware of our concerns with that, and there was certainly the enforcement. I think the other thing too is that we, you know, we rely on fishermen a lot to, you know, um, fishermen will be very quick to report the misuse of something if it happens. Um, we get that from the public. Um, and then also just reports from the fishermen themselves that we're using this gear and we're using it the way it's supposed to be, you know, used in the sloughs outside the main channels and we're obviously catching, you know, the non-salmon species. We didn't get any reports at all of, of folks um, misusing it and that there was a lot of uh, fall chum that were being harvested incidentally or anybody that was using it the way they shouldn't have been using it. Um, as a matter of fact, all we got from our fishermen were a lot of thanks and gratitude uh, for being able to use that gear um, to be able to get the non-salmon species. Um, to kind of back that up a little bit is that in our permit information, when we issue permits to folks, we did see a pretty marked increase uh, above the average of the number of whitefish that were harvested this year. Uh, and that was folks going out and targeting uh, the non-salmon species with that gear. 
then also in the postseason surveys too, it looks like that there's kind of some reports that there was an above average uh, capture of non-salmon species. At this point in time, you know, we're just completing getting all of our postseason survey information together, uh, mainly with uh, trying to provide at least some sort of a, a you know salmon species harvest. Um, it does look it, it does look like there was some reported harvest of that four inch mesh um, that we're seeing, um, but it looks like it was very small. We're talking minimal reported in the tens and maybe fifties, um, and no more than that. So, but to have any kind of real number. Um, I, we don't have that at that point in time. And then the second part of your question regarding the fish wheels, um, just to be very clear on that, when fish wheels were operated during the closure, they had to be manned 24 seven. Um, that meant that someone had to be watching the wheel spinning in the water. Um, if their fall chum, for example, had been captured or was caught in the wheel, that would have to be immediately returned to the river. Um, there was no live boxes involved because if, if the wheel was coming around, and there was a fall chum in it, then that went right back in the river on that spot. Um, if there wasn't someone who was manning the wheel at all times, that wheel wasn't operating. So um, I hope that answered your question, Tim. Yeah, thanks for that. Any, uh, just checking in, uh, Tim, any further questions uh, that you'd like to pose at this time? No, no, uh, that's good for me, thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, so next we'll move to Canadian panel member Dennis Zimmerman uh, with a question or comment. Uh, go ahead. Hi there. Thanks. Um, thanks for that. Uh, great presentations again. Nice to see you, Jeff. Um, I wanted to, uh, I have a question related to the, I guess, the interrelationship between harvest of Chinook and harvest of fall chum. Um, this particularly at the community level. So it's probably more of a question maybe for those members from the US on the panel that reside in, in, uh, in rural Alaskan communities along the river. Um, you know, we've had a long period where we've had uh, relatively good abundance we've had we've, of uh, a fall chum. And, uh, you know, at least in Canada, we always saw this as a, uh, as a way to offset some of the pressure on Chinook and perhaps really support that momentum for conservation of Chinook because there were always the fall chum and in particular summer chum. And I recognize that fall chum is not a comparative to Chinook, but at least it was some, some uh, you know, something. Um, and I guess given the economic hardships and the food security issues in particular in rural Alaska along the river, and I wanna be mindful of that, um, is there anything that the panel can do to support uh, or perhaps the RE to support continued Chinook conservation um, and ensuring that uh, we recognize that both stocks are down now potentially for a few years before the fall chum can rebuild. Um, and I'm thinking in terms of an example, I'm thinking of, is there anything innovative we can do? I mean, as, a, as an example is the dog food subsidy that uh, uh, I know in particular, Stephanie Quinn Davidson really drove this year. Um, you know, we've talked about dog food subsidies in the past, but as an example, is that something that we can look at? Is there, is there an appetite for walking on an application or providing some form of support through r &E for a dog food subsidy? Um, or are there any other innovative, forward-thinking, proactive ideas out there? Because we know we're we'll probably be in this situation again next year. So I'll stop there. And if there's any suggestions, I would love to hear them. Thank you. Mr. Co-Chair, Andy. Uh, yeah, no, I can see you there, uh, Andy, just uh, one moment. So uh, thanks, uh, Dennis, uh, for those comments. And uh, perhaps we'll let uh, panel members contemplate uh, Dennis's questions. And this may be an item to address at the 2021 preseason meeting uh, in regards to uh, uh, Dennis's comments uh, pertaining to the restoration and enhancement fund. So we'll just put a placeholder on that one, but uh, question or comment from panel member Annie Basich. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, Dennis, to answer your question, yes, uh, in the past, the r &E did fund um, shipments of fish from Prince William Sound to Eagle so that we would not harvest fall chums. And our hopes in that project was to help rebound the fall chum recovery. Um, fortunately for all of us, 
uh, chum salmon seem to rebound much quicker than king salmon do. So that's, that's a big plus. It's a matter of waiting. Uh, one of the thoughts that I, I thought would be a really interesting thing to explore uh, to help support the economics in the lower river would be to see if there was a situation where we could harvest summer chum, bright summer chum, if they're in a, a large enough abundance uh, and then process and ship to some of the upper, upper river communities um, that rely on Chinook solely, Canadian Chinook. So anything above the Tanana River, basically, that might be something to explore what the cost feasibilities are of that. Um, and then in lieu of that, ask those people not to harvest any Canadian Chinook salmon. So that, that's one thought I'd like to just throw out there for us to start thinking about. Um, and I appreciate your, your thoughts and comments on that because I think you're thinking in the right direction. We need to think outside the box in terms of these uh, years of low abundance and how we utilize fish on the entire Yukon River. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, thank you for that, and uh, maybe I'll pause and I'll ask if there's any other comments from panel members at this point on that specific uh, question that was posed by Ms. Zimmerman. Uh, Ragnar Holstrom, U.S. panel member, go ahead. So, um, Mr. Chairman, in, in, in response to uh, uh, Mr. Zimmer, Zimmerman, um, I, I, I think, Mr. Chairman, your your um, your uh, your suggestion that we put put this off so we have time to contemplate any actions that uh, could be taken until the spring meeting, preseason meeting, is a, is a good suggestion. Um, we're, we down here at the uh, the Lower River are the we, you know we're the definition of a mixed stock fishery, stocks that aren't that are not going into Canada, whether they be the, whether they be Chinook or summer chum, or pinks, or cisco, or chiefis. Um, you know, it, we're, we down here are trying to harvest those other stocks also. So we, we're going to have to put a little bit of thought into this, and I, I need to, uh, um, you know, talk to my to to the people down here if there's uh, alternatives that that might be workable, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. Uh... Ragnar, uh, any other comments uh, on this particular uh, theme uh, from panel members? Uh, uh, and I did capture the action item for the panel to uh, revisit uh, this uh, topic, which is captured as out of the box potential measures and opportunities to offset uh, fishery pressure on Canadian origin Chinook. So, uh, footnote for our uh, April 2021 pre. Not seeing uh, further comments on this uh, topic. Uh, I did have uh, two questions uh, that uh, are hopefully just uh, quick ones around clarification on this morning's presentation. Uh, I suspect uh, these are questions for Jeff Estenson, uh, but they, they do pertain to the U.S. Uh, main stem chum salmon uh, presentation. And so, Tom, uh, first question pertains to slide number 11 in the U.S. Uh, presentation, if you could bring that one up uh, for us. Uh, but trust, uh, Jeff, you know which, uh, which slide I'll be referring to, so I can start with the question. So slide number uh, 11 in the U.S. presentation is a depiction of uh, the, the daily sonar passage at pilot stations entitled Fall Chum Salmon Run Assessment adjusted using, using genetic analysis. Thank you, Tom. Uh, so the, the red line with uh, red triangles, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, but that, that's uh, indicating the cumulative total number of fall chum salmon uh, past uh, pilot station for the season, correct? Uh, that is correct. Okay, and just uh, so, I, so I don't have to guess or try to interpret here, uh, is there a is there a numeric value that you can attribute to that uh, cumulative total uh, passage? I, I see that it's uh, slightly below 200,000, but I don't want to guess exactly what that was. Is there a specific number? Understanding that this is an estimate and there's a confidence interval associated with that. Yeah, that that is correct, Mr. Chair. There is a numerical value. We do have an estimate for that particular day. 
um, and there is a confidence interval around that. And really, you know, it's kind of, yeah, so yes. All right, so that the cumulative passage of fall chum salmon for 2020 past pilot station is, let's say, just for argument's sake, around 190,000. Uh, again, that's the, the, we'll call that the midpoint of the estimate, is, is that right, or around 200,000? That is correct. We're looking at right, right around maybe the 2nd of August or so. Or, I mean, for the uh, total run, yes. Total run's okay. 190. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bonnie. So uh, we'll work with 190,000. Uh, then thank you. Thank you very much for that clarification. Mm -hmm. um, so the second part of this question, I guess, relates to slide number 16. So again, assuming that the midpoint of the estimated uh, fall chum salmon run past pilot station is around 190,000. Uh, slide number 16, Tom, if we can move to that one, uh, is a bar graph showing the breakdown based on the genetic uh, assessment of fall chum salmon. And uh, the middle two bars show the total uh, Canada genetic stock group, the orange bar being the average, recent average, uh, for prior 15 years or so, uh, blue being 2020. So uh, what I'm interpreting from this, this gra or chart is that in 2020, the total Canadian genetic stock grouping was over 20% or is, it's showing, I'm get, it, I don't think it's quite 25%, but around maybe 23%, is that right? Uh, yeah, I don't have the number right okay. in front. I think I heard a yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so I guess the rest of my question is, uh, and this is again, just a point of clarification. Uh, if one assumes that the total uh, passage of fall chum salmon past pilot station was 190,000, and then one applies approximately uh, a 23% Canadian composition rate, uh, the result is somewhere in the realm of around 45 to 50,000 Canadian origin uh, Chinook salmon. But I, if I recall correctly from the Canadian presentation, uh, the estimate uh, was, was much closer to 30, uh, uh, actually less, uh, 25. So can, can you um, provide some clarification on that? Uh, or am I misreading the information here? This is total Canada, including fishing branch. I mean, so it's not compared to the main stem itself. Okay, so basically what it's saying is that around 23% or so, or 25% was Canadian origin of 190,000. So again, mm -hmm. that, that works out to about 47 and a half thousand, which should be the combination of fishing branch origin fish uh, U.S. harvest of Canadian origin stocks and um, and uh, escapement into Canada, correct, uh, Mainstem? Yeah, depending on how, how you're putting the parts together, this is um, this is using the uh, the total run estimated by the genetics plus harvest below to come up with the total run for chum salmon for the, the whole drainage wide and then using the proportion this year to come up with the total Canada. Okay, so around 25% of the 2020 fall chum salmon return of approximately 190,000 fish uh, was Canadian origin stocks distributed between uh, fishing branch and uh, main stem Canada, correct? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that clarification. Uh, second question, um, and this one, this one's, I'm sure this one is for Jeff, uh, but I could could stand to be corrected. Uh, this pertains to slide number ten, uh, and it's a perhaps a complementary question to the one that. Uh, Canadian panel member Tim Gerbening uh, had asked. Uh, and uh, 
specifically I'm referring to the bottom portion of slide 10, which makes reference to uh, selective gear permitted to uh, be used to target other salmon and non-salmon species in districts 1-4, sub-districts 5A and district 6. Uh, so just a, a question with regards to um, management measures, implementation of management measures and results. Uh, do you, are you able to, to identify uh, how many Chinook salmon were retained uh, during that fall period where selective gear was allowed to target uh, other salmon species, so these are other than uh, fall chum salmon, and recognizing that there would be very few, if any, Chinook salmon in Districts 1 through 4, I'm assuming it would pertain primarily to District uh, 5A. Uh, do you have that information, Jeff? Or? Yeah, Mr. Co-Chair, um, we don't have that information available right now. I think just as you pointed out, when this, when this, most of this alternative gear was, or selective gear was uh, implemented, we're talking almost towards the middle of August, and the number of Chinook salmon would have been very few, um, but undoubtedly there could have been a few. Um, it's probably something that we could probably put together. It's not normal part of our uh, postseason analysis, but we might be able to get that together. Uh, but at this point in time, I don't have that information available, no. Okay. Uh, thank you. I uh, uh, appreciate that that clarification. And again, the, the context for, for the question is around uh, under, under, excuse me, understanding management measures implemented in 2020 and the outcomes. And I fully appreciate that um, the, the management approach in the United States is a, is a little bit different than in Canada with the uh, – breaking up of, we'll call it the fishing season into the summer season into the uh, versus the fall season. Um, so again, the question is, you know, uh, about Chinook interception in that fall season. Uh, I expect it's it's probably near zero, uh, but it would be helpful to uh, to just have that, that confirmed. Uh, so. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, question from Canadian panel member Dennis Zimmerman. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, uh, I received a text from the Salmon Subcommittee. They couldn't raise their hand, so I think they do want to say something. Thanks. Uh, Elizabeth? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll interpret that to mean uh, that uh, either Al, Al Von Finster or Carl Sidney. Um, Correct. Correct. Alfred, Alfred, have a question? Uh, yeah. They may, be having, they may be having technical difficulties. Elizabeth, are you there? Yeah. Can you guys hear us? Uh, yes. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Um, Roger here. I just want to um, kind of reframe people's memories that um, <clears throat> back in 2004, just to show you how far we've got with management. Back in 2004, First Nations took um, three elders to, um, to the Yukon River panel in Alaska, Anchorage. And back then, they addressed the uh, mess size of uh, six inch. And here in Yukon now, and part of the before we closed it, address that and we should use uh, six inch mess for both uh, Chinook and Chunks and just to reframe some memories here this shows you how far we've got with uh, those suggestions back then and right now today um, thank you Great. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that uh, comment, uh, Canadian panel member Roger Alfred. Uh, I'm just uh, checking and, and cognizant of our time. Uh, I don't see any further questions from panel members on Mainstem uh, Chum Salmon. So thank you very much, uh, Jeff, uh, Bonnie, Oliver, and Jesse for your presentations. I uh, do appreciate those. And we will move on to our next agenda item. Uh, where we're switching now into a continuation of uh, chum salmon reporting. However, we'll focus on the Porcupine River. Uh, so again, just very quickly, uh, Tom, uh, 
Item number five on this morning's agenda is just a refresher on the four uh, management recommendations that the Yukon River panel uh, advanced for the 2020 season. Um, if we're not able to bring those up here at this moment, uh, I think we can probably proceed. Oh, they're coming up here. Uh, so again, as we've heard uh, this morning, uh, the recommendations, the four 2020 Yukon River panel recommendations to the parties were uh, obviously considered by the parties uh, in the implementation of management strategies during the 2020 season. And again, for panel members, we'll be looking for how those are highlighted, especially for the ones that are relevant uh, in the case of porcupine fall chum salmon uh, in the subsequent uh, presentations. So with that, we will move to item number six which is the 2020 Yukon River Porcupine Chum Salmon Season Summary. And I'd like to welcome back Jeff Esteson and uh, Bonnie Borba. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. And uh, I'm assuming that uh, the panel members can follow along in their presentation packages. Uh, assuming that this one is next, this is agenda item number six, as Mr. Co-Chair mentioned. Um, I just want to say this for the U.S. portion of this, this is going to be a very brief presentation, and I don't want that to be interpreted as we didn't feel there was any effort or anything to put into this. Um, obviously, our management was pretty uh, pretty straightforward this year, um, especially how it turned, uh, applied to the fishing branch and the U.S. portion of the porcupine. Um, and I think that a lot of the pertinent information that folks are going to be looking for in a postseason summary will be provided by Jesse and Oliver. So um, I'm pretty confident that as we get into our April meeting and we start talking about our outlook and management strategy, that you're going to definitely see a much a longer presentation by us, um, you know, covering what our management will be and talking about the limitations to our assessment. Um, and some thoughts. So just want to point that out to you as you kind of see just a few slides that we have here. So if we could, please, can we go to the next slide? Slide number two. And one more. Can we hit one more click? Okay, sorry. Apparently there was some animation left in there. Um, so based on a drainage wide Yukon in season projection, as we mentioned in the previous presentation, of less than 450,000 fish for fall chum salmon. Uh, we anticipate a Canadian origin fishing branch projection of less than 18,000 fall chum salmon. As many of you know that the IMEG is 22 to 49,000 fish. And based on that projection for Canadian origin fish that I just gave you, um, that IMEG would likely not be met. And this, therefore, when we were entering the season, as far as management was concerned, we did not anticipate that there would be any salmon fishing uh, in the US portion of the Porcupine River for the entire 2020 season. And, and if we could, next slide, please, number three. So in this one right here, the top portion of the slide, fall season management actions. Um, again, as we mentioned in the previous presentation, there was no commercial salmon fishing in the US portion of the Yukon for the fall season. Um, subsistence sam fall chum salmon fishing was closed in the Yukon River drainage uh, around the middle or early part of August. And again, as I just mentioned, Porcupine River drainage was closed for the entire season. That's the U.S. portion of the Porcupine River. And just through assessment that we did escape, we did monitor escapement, uh, getting uh, information from Jesse and Oliver throughout the season as what kind of escapement was occurring at the Fishing Branch River Weir. Um, and just to mention that, uh, as you probably have already figured out, the 2020 total fall chum salmon run in Fishy Branch River escapement was the lowest on record going back to 1974. So um, that's really all we have uh, for our presentation. If you want to go to slide number four. And again, contact information for fishing game staff. And that's all we have. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jeff and Bonnie. Uh, so again, we will now move into agenda item number seven, which is the Canadian 2020 Porcupine River Chum Salmon Season Summary. And I'll invite uh, Oliver Barker and Jesse Trers from Fisheries and Oceans Canada to provide this presentation. And following the uh, conclusion of the Canadian presentation, we will have the opportunity 
for uh, panel member questions on both the U.S. and Canadian presentations as they pertain to uh, 2020 uh, Porcupine River Fishing Branch uh, Chum Salmon Returns. So, Oliver. Apologies, blinded by the sun. Um, good afternoon, uh, Yukon River panel co-chairs, panel members, and alternates and advisors. Uh, as I think we all know now, my name is Jesse Treras, and I'm the Yukon River Fishery Manager with Fisheries and Oceans Canada, based in Whitehorse. Uh, and Oliver Barker and I, as Oliver is the Senior Biologist for Fisheries and Oceans Canada, Yukon River Operations. Uh, together we will provide the Canadian postseason review of Porcupine River Chum Salmon for the 2020 season. Slide number two, please. We may have to rely on people using their own presentations here. Uh, oh, glitch. okay. Follow Sorry, Jesse. Uh, it's uh, Steve here. Um, we're just waiting for the uh, the presentation to come up uh, on screen uh, here momentarily. Thank you, Jesse, for bearing with me and just laying that up now. Okay, thank you, Tom. That should just be coming free. Thank you. Thank you, awesome. So over the course of our presentation, uh, I should point out, uh, contrary to the, the first bullet, I won't be providing a review of the preseason recommendations. I think that we have covered those off quite sufficiently in the prior presentations. However, uh, as in the uh, prior presentations, Oliver and I will jointly present a time series of fishing branch river chum assessment and associated management and that will be followed with Oliver providing a post-season assessment uh, summary and finally an overview of the environmental conditions of Porcupine River and its tributaries. Slide number three, please. Ah, sorry, here we are. Uh, so you'll be familiar with this, this style of slide by now. Uh, we're going to be looking at the preseason forecast, uh, season projection and, and revision, uh, and then pilot station numbers that guided early season management uh, all the way upriver to numbers uh, from the weir at Fishing Branch. Uh, as noted, uh, we did not operate porcupine sonar this year, so we don't have an assessment project uh, at Old Crow. Slide four. So uh, we'll now start providing a chronological reporting of management and, assess and assessment of fishing branch chum during the 2020 season. Uh, essentially, this is the time series review uh, of the assessment information that was available at the time, including management expectations, activities underway, and the implementation of the Canadian fisheries management strategy. So on this particular slide, which is slide number four, we have an overview of the preseason forecast for fishing branch stocks, as well as the revised in-season projection. I'm going to start with uh, a look at the preseason forecast first, which was for a run size of 33,000 to 42,000 fishing branch chum. And uh, just a reminder that the Interim Management Escapement Goal, or IMEG, for Fishing Branch is 22,000 to 49,000 chum. So as we know, the Pacific Salmon Treaty does not identify harvest shares for these stocks. Uh, however, in Canada, um, management and allocation is informed by a Canadian Harvest Guideline. Uh, which in 2020 was identified as a minimum, the minimum spawning uh, target and borrowed the 32% Canadian harvest share guideline uh, used for main stem chum stocks. Anyway, suffice to say, uh, the harvest guideline uh, for Canadian uh, 
uh, fishing branch chum was 5,300 to 9,700 fishing branch chum. So those were uh, the fish that were anticipated to be available for harvest. So, of course, uh, the expectation was that there would be fishery opportunities for the First Nation fishery. Uh, however, it was undetermined as of yet as to whether there would be opportunities in the public angling fishery. And for your reference, uh, there are neither commercial nor domestic fisheries located in the Porcupine River drainage. So still on slide number four, we see that the fishing branch forecast was revised as of August 10th to fewer than 12,000 chum which would not be sufficient to meet the lower end of the escapement goal, nor provide for a First Nation fishery or a public angling fishery for that matter. Uh, slide number five, please. As with main stem Canadian, or Canadian origin chum, we can also estimate pilot passage of porcupine chum using daily counts and genetics. Graph the porcupine chum passage uh, estimated each day is in green, and total chum that includes the U.S. origin and main stem Canadian origin are in gray, uh, with the average passage of porcupine chum shown by the dashed line. However, uh, I should note that porcupine passage at pilot is less reliable than the main stem estimate. Uh, they really are quite a small proportion of the overall run, about 4%. So, effectively sampling uh, that in the test fishing where um, where genetics are sampled is, is quite difficult. However, like for main stem chum, we can see uh, the estimated number of porcupine chum past pilot this year was well below average. And this is showing the, the total passage here uh, when the run had passed pilot. Slide six. Moving upriver to the daily counts at Fishing Branch Weir for this year, um, as there's no harvest upstream of fishing branch, the weir counts are also considered to be spawning escapement. This year's count was the lowest on record at 4,795. Slide seven. It is well below the long-term average of 42,000. Slide eight. It's also below the more recent lower 10-year average of 20,000. Slide nine. Slide nine provides a written summary of the fishing branch man uh, salmon management actions during the 2020 season. So with respect to Federal or Fisheries and Oceans Canada, Chum Salmon Management, uh, DFO closed the public fishery to angling for salmon in the Porcupine River from July 29th to November 30th. Uh, we prohibited retention of chum in the public fishery on the Porcupine River from September 11th through to November 30th, and of course uh, hosted and participated in weekly interagency calls with ADF&G. We shared in-season information with the First Nation and Renewable Resource Council uh, during in-season assessment and uh, management calls. With respect to Vantetkwichin government fishery management, the First Nation government cooperated with DFO to deliver the fishing branch assessment project and engaged First Nation citizens and also considered in-season information and updates, including the Salmon Subcommittee's recommendations, uh, first to conserve and then secondly to stop harvest of chum salmon. Um, the Vantet Gwich'in government did direct their uh, citizens to not harvest chum. And, uh, you know, when given the, the location and the isolation of the community of Old Crow um, and the traditional and, you know, not to mention the practical dependency on food from the land, um, it just, it must have been such an exceptionally difficult situation to be in. I know that is not just the case for Vantet Gwich'in. I know that this is a hardship that was seen by many First Nations, um, but uh, yeah, I just really wanted to uh, point. Um, Slide number 10, please. 
So here we have a, a post-season report card of Fishing Branch River Chum, including harvest and escapement outcomes. Uh, we see that the total Fishing Branch run size was estimated at around 5,000. There are no harvest shares identified in the treaty for Fishing Branch stocks for either the U.S. or Canada. Uh, U.S. harvest uh, is estimated at around 250, and the Canadian harvest of Fishing Branch Chum uh, is around 63 fish. Uh, and the spawning escapement estimate is 4,795 chum. I would like to point out that there is an error on this slide. Uh, it should state that the Canadian origin run size was insufficient to meet the IMAG of 22,000 to 49,000 fish. This information will be, it will be corrected and updated on the Yukon River panel website. Just wanted to... And, uh, Thank you. Slide 11, please. Apologies. All right. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Let's return to this year's count at Fishing Branch Weir and compare this to past years. Slide 12. Bonding escapement was the lowest recorded and well below the IMEG, uh, shown here by the black bars. Slide 13. Let's look at harvest uh, added to spawning escapement. Uh, U.S. harvest is in gray, Canadian harvest is in red, above spawning escapement in green. Harvest this year was smaller than average, uh, both in Canada and the U.S., and knowing that harvest would not have resulted in meeting the time egg. At 14. Here's total estimated run size, which combines spawning escapement and downstream harvest, was also the lowest on record at 5,000 fish. That's well below the long-term and 10-year averages. Slide 15. Also look at age, sex, and length from fishing branch fish. Um, this slide, we're looking at the age of fish sampled at fishing branch. And uh, in this case, we did not see the same reduced proportion of age four fish that we saw in lower river projects. Your sample was 54% age four fish, and that's close to the average. Slide 16. At the male-female ratio at Fishing Branch this year, uh, the female proportion was 49%, which is slightly below the average of 53%. Factoring in run strength, this year saw the lowest female return on record at less than 2,400 fish. Slide 17. Finally, looking at patterns over time in length of male and female Fishing Branch chum, with the males above and females below here, both male and female fish at Fishing Branch were roughly the average size this year. Slide 17, or sorry, slide 18. Uh, and before ending, I'll briefly review environmental conditions in the Canadian sections of the porcupine drainage. Uh, our information on environmental conditions on the porcupine were more limited than for other rivers this year. Uh, general story here is near average water levels and temperatures. Water level data through September show the Porcupine River was slightly above average, then receding to average by month's end. We don't have in-season water temperature data this year. Uh, however, air temperatures in that in that region were closer to average than in the than in the south, which had a slide 19. I'll uh, turn it back to co-chairs, and we'll be. Happy to speak to any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Oliver and Jesse. And so we will now go to questions from panel members on the mine and fishing branch fall chum reporting uh, for 2020. And we'll start with U.S. panel member Andy Bassich. Uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, this could be answered by either Oliver or Jeff, but I, I'm a little confused. In Jeff's presentation, there was never an opening on the Porcupine River for for fall chum, but yet it's showing a U.S. harvest of 200 and some odd fish. So can someone please 
uh, explained to me that. <laughs> Thank you. I, Just I a clarification point more than anything else. Thank you. Sure. Those, the, that harvest I'm assuming is happening on the main stem below Fort Yukon. And I guess I would ask then how, how, how are you sure that those are, are, are those genetically tested? There's, um, if it, maybe, maybe, maybe Jeff is more, <laughs> more appropriate to speak to it. I, I'm happy to if. Yeah, I mean, that's not an estimate that we made on our side that I'm aware of, and Bonnie can pipe in on this, but my assumption is this, that they take the total, that whoever made that estimate would take the total subsistence harvest on the U.S. side this year, which was 6,200 estimated, and just apply 4% to that. I don't have my calculator in front of me, but uh, um, that's the only way I can see that that was estimated. It's not through any genetic sampling um, that I'm aware of. It's, it's simply just using that factor. And Bonnie, is that your understanding? Yes, that's. I assume that's what they would have had to do to get those fish, because we did harvest some fall chum in the lower river and they applied the 4% to get the value. Yeah, I, I can confirm that, that, that the, the estimate of harvest for fishing branch fish is uh, made using 4% uh, of the uh, harvest of fall chum uh, in the main stem. Based, and that's based on um, proportion of fish that seem to be in the run uh, at genetics at that pilot. And, and looking as well at uh, season run size compared to drainage, what, drainage wide run size. Okay, thank you. Just a quick follow up for me. I, I, I understand why that was applied like that, but we know that fall chum are very bank oriented, especially as they go up river farther. So in light of knowing that there was specific uh, harvesters taking place on the porcupine side of the Yukon River. I, I just find that very difficult um, to apply that without some sort of actual testing of that. Um, and that's the type of thing that shows up in reports that, that 10 years later comes up as a, a question mark for people. So I'm not having heartburn over it, but I, I just think that that's, um, I would question those numbers being put into reports and publish. That's all I have to say with that. Thank you. Appreciate your reports. Very much, uh, Andy, and it's a good comment. Uh, I think, you know, perhaps the, the bigger picture question would be aside from 2020, um, how, uh, how is the, the quote unquote complete um, US interception of porcupine bound uh, fish, uh, I guess for lack of a better description, tabulated or, or reconstructed, recognizing that not only uh, porcupine bound fish, uh, or excuse me, that, that the interception of porcupine bound fish would also occur in the main stem downstream of the, the confluence. Uh, so I'm not sure if I confused the question even further, Jeff, but uh, I suspect that's what uh, Andy is asking. Mr. Chair, I could uh, maybe um, weigh in on this a little bit too. I think what Andy is, is bringing up is a very valid comment. Um, I think in most years when we're looking at harvest levels in Alaska of fall chum salmon um, that are much, much higher um, that perhaps um, using this methodology of uh, the average proportion of uh, Canadian porcupine fall chum um, and applying that average proportion genetically to much larger harvests is the best that we can do. It's not ideal um, by any means, even in years such as that. I think that to Andy's uh, point that in a year like this, when the harvest was so low, uh, when there were such significant restrictions and closures in Alaska and Canada on fall chum salmon, that um, it calls into larger question that using that same and applying that same methodology. Um, in that regard. So um, it may be um, somewhat of a, a legacy of the methodology used historically. 
Uh, but recognizing that even genetic analysis has levels of uncertainty and confidence intervals surrounding um, those estimates, that it's possible that if you were to, I'm not sure if this can be done, and perhaps a geneticist or a biometrician may need to weigh in on this a little bit more, uh, but it's possible that that direct application of uh, genetic proportions to this year on such a small harvest, the confidence interval would likely go below zero is would be my guess. Um, so um, I think it's a valid point that Andy is bringing up. Um, I think it's something that uh, perhaps we need to uh, consider uh, alternate methodologies to try and get to that same question of whether or not um, Alaskan harvest in years like this that were so low um, harvested or what uh, component of that harvest may be Canadian porcupine bound. Thank you. Great. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Co-Chair, and uh, not to belabor this, but, uh, you know, part of, I guess, part of this question relates to uh, the questions that I had posed on the main stem uh, run reconstruction. So, again, using the, um, the pilot uh, station and Canadian all stock proportions, uh, you know, an estimated return of 43,000 uh, Canadian origin chum salmon in the main stem uh, based on pilot data. Uh, based on escapement information, when we combine uh, fishing branch uh, as well as uh, main stem Canadian border, we get just under uh, 30,000. So there's about a 13,000 or 30% or so discrepancy. So I fully appreciate that the answer to the question is that with such low numbers and recognizing that these are estimates, that the confidence intervals associated with those numbers often exceed the absolute numbers that we're talking about. So hopefully that provides um, clarification for, uh, for panel members if you are trying to add up the numbers uh, again, the, uh, the, the majority of the numbers that are presented in the post-season estimates, or excuse me, post-season presentations are estimates of in-river abundance, and the midpoint is what's referenced, and there are confidence of intervals around that, so. Uh, okay, so next we'll go to a question from Canadian panel member Dennis Zimmerman. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Steve. Um, so, uh, I have a couple questions, two questions, uh, and I apologize. They may be somewhat uh, basic fish biology or fish distribution questions, but I don't think I've ever asked them before. And I, am just trying to get a sense. Um, so given we have a mixed stock fishery that travels extremely long distances, spreads throughout Alaska and throughout the Yukon, and we have the main stem and all the tributaries, um, given these numbers are extremely low at some of these tributaries like on Fishing Branch or for Chinook, say in Whitehorse near the fish ladder, um, you know, we're, we're, we're starting to count them in the, in the hundreds in some cases. Um, is, this, is this a phenomenon that is, is something uh, given Canada's proximity to the headwaters and the farther distances, or is this being seen in some of the lower river, river longer tributaries like the Tanana? Like, are we seeing the same rate and small numbers you know, I, I'm, I'm mindful of Duana Coyne from Teslin Clinic Council saying the canary in the coal mine in Teslin. Um, you know, are, are, do we see that same phenomenon the farther you are from a main stem or is it mainly a Canadian headwaters moving um, downriver? That's my first question. And my second question is, um, you know, given there's such low numbers here, and I hate to throw the word out there, but I'm going to throw it out. You know, when are we? When do we sound the real alarm for threat of extinction? Um, you know, what is the threshold we're using on either side of the border or at the Yukon River panel to start saying this is potentially a run that's going to be extinct? Um, thanks. Okay, thanks uh, for those. Uh questions, Dennis. I think uh, maybe to restate the, the first one uh, to, to help perhaps some of the, uh, the JTC staff with a response. So uh, what Dennis is asking is um, whether or not uh, there's a disproportionate uh, decline in, we'll call it substocks that are further away or further proximate to the main stem 
than uh, the main stem stocks. Uh, does that clarify for, um, for our technical committee representatives and anyone would like to uh, provide a response to that question? Uh, this is Bonnie. I can try to address it. Um, I'm not, you know, we don't have a lot of information between, you know, Tana versus Upper as far as looking if there's the difference that he's asking about. There's only been a few years that, or there's a couple occasions when Tana has outperformed the upper stocks. But the one thing we have been watching, you know, is that we know the the porcupine system has generally been including the sheen jack when we were monitoring that and fishing branch that they had a different production or lower productions than the other stocks. So if the chandelier and the main stem to Canada were doing well and the, the Tanana would also be doing well. And so that's the only indication I know so far is that the porcupine system has been different than the other stocks. Thank you for that. Uh, any other technical committee representatives uh, like to weigh in on that uh, question? Sorry, I'm not a member of the technical <laughs> committee. Uh, it's Al calling from Yukon Salmon Subcommittee, but I can't put up my hand, so I just uh, got in there. One thing that you, that the Americans and the Canadians should realize is that we are not really looking at the headwater stocks in Canada. We are looking at a headwater stock in the Whitehorse area and the Takini River, but we're not looking at the headwaters of the uh, Teslin River or the Pelly River of the Stewart River. I've been up in the, the headwaters of the Stewart River as far up as the Gold Beaver River last year, not the, the summer uh, 2020, summer 2019. There weren't a lot of salmon there. There's uh, the upper headwaters of the Pelly River. There aren't many salmon there and there haven't been there for the last 15 years or so. So I think that the I think that it's a good implication that the salmon have been disappearing from the headwaters of the Yukon River, but our um, network of um, being able to count them hasn't been uh, strong enough to be able to to catch them. And that's for the Chinook salmon. I should also mention that the uh, Canadian government has asked, or sorry. The council, Kotsiwik, we call it, it's, it's equivalent of our um, uh, Endangered Species Act. And they have asked for some kind of a, a um, account of the Yukon River salmon uh, with a, the, the implicit idea that they want to list it at some time in the future. So that's something we have to talk about, Steve, down the road a bit, but it's something that should be identified now. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Al and uh, Dennis. Uh, I guess on the latter question, and, and perhaps bridging uh, Al's comments, uh, you know, given this is an international forum, uh, just to provide some insight on uh, what uh, Canadian uh, panel member Al von Finster was referring to, is that the uh, Canadian Committee for the Status of uh, Endangered Wildlife in Canada has been asked to review uh, the status of a number of Pacific salmon stocks in British Columbia and Yukon. Uh, one of those uh, stocks that's been requested for review is uh, Yukon River uh, uh, Chinook salmon. And so essentially what that process will entail is uh, primarily a multi-year review of the status and trends uh, of that particular species, uh, culminating in a technical publication that provides uh, advice or recommendation for uh, the Government of Canada's consideration around the future management of, of the stock. So hopefully that provides some uh, clarification on a uh, Canadian domestic uh, process that's underway uh, in respect to um, Al's uh, comment. Okay, so uh, just checking to see if there's any uh, further questions from uh, panel members on the 2020 uh, Porcupine Fishing Branch uh, postseason reviews presented by both Canada and the United States. Uh. Mr. Chair, uh, just a quick maybe um, check on that. Um, I'm not sure if um, Eric Weingarth might have been trying to be recognized there. I did see him. 
unmuting um, if he has a question or comment. Yeah, hi, Mr. Tears. Um, this is Eric in St. Mary's. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah, I've been trying to get on for quite a while. I, I just wanted to bring up, too, in, in 2019 and 2020, there was, uh, in, in Norton Sound, there was, and it's not being reflected in, in uh, a lot of this discussion this morning, there was a lot of die-off of uh, um, bearded seals, spotted seals. Um, there's a huge die-off uh, this year and last year of, of uh, king crab stocks uh, washing up on the beaches and krill and shrimp uh, washing up for miles on Norton Sound beaches. Um, in 2019, um, we seen a, a big drop um, when the hot water and in the Andrevsky, we had uh, literally thousands of, of chum salmon didn't even reach up the uh, Andrevsky. Uh, we're still full of eggs and, and we're floating down the river. Um, that wasn't reflected in many of the reports too. Um, another thing that I'd like to see in the future for myself um, is, is seeing, I, I know, for the last several years, we've been seeing high water um, um, dramatically go up and down in in the headwaters of the Yukon, and and I'm sure there are records with the uh, at the dams of of, uh, of of flow and and releases. And I'd just to be curious too if if uh, water levels are having an impact too on on headwater fish, and, and that's for both Chinook and and uh, and uh, chum salmon. I. I just want to make a comment too that I am concerned about fishing branch and porcupine. Um, I think I've said that for the last few years that I'm trying to figure out as, as a panel member what we can do to increase those numbers and, and it's still of concern to me. And I, I think on the U.S. side as far as management, I think Jeff's been doing the best he can with what he's got as far as technology and information and trying to reduce or to uh, have lower impact on on uh, the harvest into the fishing branch, and I appreciate that, Jeff. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Very much, uh, and uh, apologize for uh, missing uh, missing you earlier on, uh, Eric. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll just do one final check, and perhaps I'll, I'll pause for a moment uh, in the event that uh, there are any questions from uh, panel members who are not able to uh, raise their hands. Uh, so any, any further questions on the porcupine and fishing branch uh, fall chum salmon reporting? Not, uh, not seeing any, I'd like to express our thanks to uh, both the United States and Canadian presenters for the fall chum salmon uh, reports this morning. Very, uh, very useful information and do appreciate that uh, you are all uh, working very diligently and doing the best you can in both collecting and synthesizing and communicating this information uh, for us. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, with that, uh, we're about uh, 25 minutes uh, before the hour, uh, which means we're slightly ahead of schedule. What that means is that uh, perhaps rather than jumping ahead in our agenda, we will break for lunch uh, approximately 25 minutes early. So we will resume in bilateral session at 1 o'clock Alaska time, uh, 3 o'clock Yukon time, and we'll be starting with agenda item number 9, which is a uh, panel member uh, discussion and questions around coordinated U.S., Canada, Canadian origin, Yukon River salmon management. Uh, Mr. Co-Chair, anything further to add uh, before we break? Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. No, nothing additional to add. Um, I think we'll still have adequate time to address um, uh, the remaining uh, agenda item topics um, through the afternoon and provide for opportunity for public testimony. Um, so I think we can proceed with a, a little bit longer lunch uh, for this go round. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairs. Oh, uh, yes, do we have someone uh, on the line? Yes, uh, good morning. This is uh, Bill Olster from St. Mary's. 
I just want to say hello to all my friends on the other side of the border. Good morning. You guys are doing a good job. Thank you very much, uh, Bill, and uh, appreciate you coming on to uh, to wish us well. We we also hope that uh, you're doing uh, doing well as uh, as well, and uh, glad that you're able to join us today. Good to hear yes, from you. I've been Bill. listening in yesterday and this morning. This morning. Great. Right. Well, thank you for that. And uh, with that, uh, uh, we will reconvene at uh, 1 o'clock Alaska time, 3 o'clock uh, Yukon time. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Co-Chair. Just doing a quick sound check. Uh, we are at the top of the hour, and uh, I'd ask if uh, ready to proceed with our final uh, afternoon session of the Yukon River Panel's 2020 postseason meeting. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Yes, um, I think we still might have a couple people that are logging back in, but I think the majority of our section membership is available, and uh, we can proceed with the afternoon agenda. Thank you for the confirmation. So perhaps to start off, uh, just to confirm for panel members, uh, we are into the final afternoon sessions as outlined on our agenda and currently on track. Uh, for the remainder of this afternoon, which is a two hour, scheduled to be a two hour and 15 minute session, uh, we have a number of agenda items that we will be addressing. Firstly, a discussion uh, for panel members around coordinated uh, United States and uh, Canadian uh, Yukon River salmon management. Uh, following that uh, agenda item, we will move into uh, provision of information on the Yukon River Salmon Restoration and Enhancement Fund, uh, starting with a status update on 2020 projects are currently underway. And then that will be followed by an update on 2021 project uh, proposals and the review process uh, currently underway. The, uh, the afternoon session will uh, conclude with a 30 minute opportunity for public testimony. Thus far, it's my understanding we have uh, five individuals uh, or entities that have uh, registered to provide public testimony this afternoon. Just a reminder, that is scheduled to occur between uh, 2.30 and, oh, excuse me, uh, uh, 2.30 and 3 o'clock Alaska time and 4.30 and 5 o'clock Yukon time. Uh, there is a possibility we may be slightly ahead of schedule, so we will move into public testimony following the uh, Restoration and Enhancement Fund uh, presentations and discussion. The afternoon session and our bilateral meeting sessions will conclude at the end of the day uh, with uh, confirmation of the 2021 Yukon River Panel preseason meeting as well as closing remarks. With that, uh, I'll check uh, with you, Mr. Co-Chair, any changes or additions you'd like to propose for this afternoon session? No, Mr. Co-Chair, I think that's, uh, that sounds good. It's following with our expectation. I guess maybe one quick um, clarification to make um, is that um, the um, pre-registered and signed up individuals for public testimony, um, that um, we may have some folks online um, that, uh, and we've had a couple of folks that uh, appreciatively spoke up just to say hi over the past two days, but uh, we certainly wanna make sure that we provide uh, opportunity to those individuals that have uh, taken the time to pre-register um, when it comes time and, and giving them opportunity to speak. Thank you for that. Uh, okay, so with that, uh, we will proceed to agenda item number nine. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is an opportunity for uh, panel members to discuss uh, the coordinated uh, management between Canada and the United States of Yukon River salmon stocks. I know that there was, this was an item that was requested by panel members and uh, 
I'm uh, not entirely sure if, uh, if the principal interest is to have a discussion amongst panel members or if there are questions for uh, agency representatives or members of the, the Joint Technical Committee, but uh, I will perhaps uh, open the floor to panel members to perhaps uh, provide the opportunity to ask any questions you might have or perspectives you'd like to share on the topic of coordinated uh, U.S. and Canadian management. Uh, see that uh, we have uh, Canadian panel member Tim Gerberding. Uh, if you'd like to start us off, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, I guess that I'm wondering, you know, what steps we can take to become a little bit more collaborative and cooperative in you know, managing salmon on both sides of the border. And I'd like to uh, begin our discussion by just reading a few excerpts from the Pacific Salmon Treaty and the Yukon River Salmon Agreement. And so uh, section 17, chapter eight of the Pacific Salmon Treaty says, each year the Yukon River panel shall review the performance of the fishery management regimes of both parties for the preceding season with a view to making recommendations to the respective management entities for improving management performance in order to achieve agreed objectives in future years. And I think that complementary to that, there are sections in the Yukon River Salmon Agreement, specifically 14 and 15, that provide as follows. The Yukon River Panel shall make recommendations to the management entities concerning the conservation and coordinated management of salmon originating in the Yukon River in Canada. That's section 14. And section 15 says the respective management entities shall take into account the recommendations of the Yukon River Panel in the adoption of regulations and shall ensure the enforcement of these regulations these entities shall exchange annual fishery management plans prior to each season. <clears throat> so I think that, you know, what's notable here is that the word shall is used in each of these clauses, which I think makes it mandatory for us as the UK to do these things. And, and, and I'm not sure that we're doing them. And to the extent that we are, I'm not sure that we're doing them as well as we can. So looking back at section 17, chapter eight of the Pacific Salmon Treaty, you know, the panel shall review the performance uh, of both parties for the preceding season with a view to making recommendations for improving management performance. Now, it's certainly my view that uh, our management performance has been less than perfect and could be improved going forward. And so I'd like to see the parties, you know, become a little bit more active in coordinated management here. And I think that, you know, that could certainly uh, apply to, you know, certain in-season and post-season, um, you know, management actions. Um, you know, I think that uh, we each have a vested interest in the way that the other party manages Yukon River salmon, because you know the health of these salmon is vital to our mutual interests here. And so, you know, I think that we can exchange information better than we are. I think that you know, uh, when it comes to taking in-season management actions, that Canada might have some good advice for the United States. And similarly, because this is really very much a two-way street, I don't make it sound want to sound otherwise. Uh, you know, uh, Canada, or sorry, the United States, you know, may have some, some good advice to offer Canada, you know, once the fish are crossing the border. So, so, so I'd like to talk about this a little bit, if we can, and, and just see if we can find mechanisms that would enable us to be a little bit more collaborative in managing on both sides of the border here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tim, uh, for that, uh, you know, I guess, introduction and context. And uh, I'd like to express appreciation to Tom, who has brought up the Yukon River Salmon Agreement uh, under the Pacific Salmon Treaty on screen. So the 
uh, the specific references that um, Canadian panel member Tim Gerberding was pointing out were uh, sections uh, 14, 15, and 17, I believe. So perhaps uh, just to establish the context, I might look to the, um, I'm not sure if it's the Joint Technical Committee co-chairs or Joint Technical Committee members responsible for uh, management uh, in, in both Alaska and in Canada. Uh, could you offer up some initial commentary or, or provide some perspectives on how the parties, namely the management agencies, cooperate uh, in season to coordinate uh, respective management efforts? Uh, Yeah, good afternoon, folks. This is Zach Buller with uh, um, the USJTC co-chair and Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Um, I guess uh, the, the specifics of in-season management coordination, I will uh, defer to uh, ADF and G and US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, <clears throat> fisheries managers to speak to. But, but I will comment uh, from JTC, um, from my perspective, speaking on behalf of the USJTC, uh, you know, much of our, we are, are not particularly active uh, as a JTC in season on in season assessment and management where uh, many of our uh, members are JTC members, our agency staff. Um, the mechanism, as I understand it through the agreement, uh, really empowers the agencies to coordinate efforts in season. Um, and, and the JTC is a platform that, that can encourage that. But we have made, uh, had some internal discussions amongst the JTC in the last uh, year or so, looking for more opportunities for in-season data sharing, uh, in-season collaboration amongst uh, agency staff, et cetera, kind of recognizing that that is a, um, a, a necessary communication and coordination in season and, and it really is through the through the agency uh, staff where that happens but the JTC has has acknowledged that uh, is uh, encouraging that level of coordination to happen uh, and, and we have been having some ongoing discussions about how we as a bilateral JTC can help facilitate that through data repositories uh, streamlining data requests um, those types of things um, but I'll, I'll defer to Steve Smith if, if he'd like to add anything else from the JTC perspective, and then certainly turn it over to folks uh, within ADF and G and Fish and Wildlife Services service to speak to how they have been uh, making that happen. I mean, uh, yeah, thanks, Zach. Um, and I would agree with your uh, synopsis of the, the JTC uh, as an entity itself. Uh, it really uh, defers to the agencies that, uh, during the in-season in terms of coordinated management. Um, but there is very much a coordinated effort, at least to exchange information and, and uh, discuss uh, what the agencies are viewing in-season. Um, we have <clears throat> in-season weekly uh, conversations uh, between managers, biologists uh, on both sides. Um, and, and uh, discuss what they see happening in terms of assessment projects, any uh, anomalies, uh, those kind of things that they that might come up that they, they see maybe uh, implicating uh, the information that they're they're seeing. So I mean I think um, probably this year I think it gets better every year. I think this year was probably quite uh, very consistent in terms of. Uh, you know, the week, the weekly meetings. And, and of course, I mean, if there are questions mid, mid week, I do know that uh, our staff uh, reach out to ADF and G folks and, and, uh, and vice versa. So I would, I would characterize the in-season interaction and communication between agencies as uh, quite good. Hey, and uh, over to uh, Dina Jallen, Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'd very much like to um, thank uh, 
I thank you all for those those previous remarks regarding in season collaboration. Um, we do uh, share a lot of information in season. The the weekly year for teleconferences are a great a great way to share um, assessment information across the river, uh, both sides of the border. We also do uh, weekly uh, updates throughout the season, which update our assessment data so far. Uh, and a lot of our in-season information is uh, reported daily uh, as a phone recording and on Facebook. Uh, so there's a lot of information that is um, that, we, that we are sharing throughout the season. Um, our uh, management decisions themselves, it can also kind of, it can sometimes seems a little uh, hectic in the summer because we are looking at you know five or six districts throughout the river and what we may be seeing in one part of the river is a different situation from another part of the river so we're we're, we're juggling a lot of balls in season and we certainly um, you know appreciate having eyes on the data and 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 you know more input kind of you know looking at what we're doing and, and getting some feedback on what we're doing but um, we also have to keep in mind um, the timelines that we have for receiving information, making decisions and disseminating information. We're always trying to make sure that our fishermen have enough lead time to kind of help, you know, plan their days and, and plan their summer activities. And we don't want to, you know, we don't like to make decisions too, uh, with too short of a lead time for them. So we're always trying to think about information that we get and then timelines for information that we can get out and, and try to, you know, make sure that people have enough time to get that information and, and work on their, their fishing schedules. And then, um, I don't know if Holly wants to speak uh, in particular, Holly Carroll, she was in season manager last season, but uh, her and Fred West uh, meet almost daily with the Canadian managers or uh, meet almost weekly with Canadian, uh, sorry, the Canadian managers um, and then share also early projection information with them throughout the season. Very much uh, for that, uh, Dina. Maybe we'll go next to uh, Jeff Estenson uh, from Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, something that um, in, over the years, the 10 years that I've been the fall season manager, I've always had uh, some sort of contact with uh, DFO managers over the course of the season, um, just to talk about you know things that we were doing on our side, give them a heads up so they were aware of it. But I think this year, which was different and was in my mind was very beneficial for both sides, DFO managers and fish and game managers, and also U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service staff enjoyed in on these as well, is that we had weekly uh, teleconferences with Jesse and Oliver and um, to just discuss what we were seeing, what was going on, you know, what we were thinking about in terms of management, um, you know, the reasons why we were doing what we were doing. And these meetings got to the point where it was just a reoccurring Wednesday, 10 o'clock meeting with DFO, which it wasn't just to set it up by necessity or I have a, I wanna talk or whatever. This was a weekly scheduled event that we had that for the most part happened every week. So, um, and again, as a manager and talking with DFO, I thought that was very helpful uh, for both sides understanding exactly what was going on, why we were these, you know, what we were seeing, um, the decisions we were making. And, and I truly hope um, that that becomes something of a regular thing every year. Uh, at least that's my intent and expectation. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Very much, uh, Jeff. Uh, so next we'll go to Jesse Terris from Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Go ahead. Hi, thank you. Uh, and yes, I would echo everything that Jeff and Dina said. I felt that, um, yeah, so this this summer uh, we did have near weekly conversations, sometimes more frequently. And those those calls often fell on days when ADF and G staff were um, about to or were in the process of preparing their um, their their update out to uh, the public and um, and yeah so we were in some cases we were able to receive you know a, a heads up which does help for us to more on the domestic side but to to what what can be expected but these conversations and this this integration and 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 collaboration in some ways too. It really also helped with uh, passing information about what was happening at the um, assessment sites. So ordinarily, 
you know, Eagle would have been manned by and womaned <laughs> by both uh, ADF and G staff as well as DFO staff. And of course, this year with the pandemic, uh, that was just not possible. Um, so yeah, we were able to have you know conversations. Uh, a lot can be relayed via email and on updates, uh, but there's a lot more that can be shared. I think in these conversations, weekly conversations, uh, that can be somewhat also leaning towards a, a candid side, and that was very, very helpful. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, I would, I would expect and hope that these uh, continue uh, for next year. With respect to providing um, advice or, or guidance or, or direction to ADF and G is per their management. And admittedly, I am I am uncomfortable with that uh, beyond reminding the parties what the uh, objectives are as per the Yukon River Salmon Agreement and principles in the Pacific Salmon Treaty. Um, but yeah, I felt that this year we had a uh, um, excellent uh, communication, which which really helped, especially in a year when. Uh, pandemic is happening and we were unable to get in person. That's all. Thank you, Jesse. And now over to Fred West from Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Go ahead, Fred. Yeah, hi. Um, Fred West, uh, summer season research biologist. And I guess I'd just like to reiterate what everybody else has already been saying. But um, yeah, as far as collaboration, I felt that this year was one of the better years of collaborating between um, DFO staff and, and ADF and G. And as far as like in-season assessment type of information, run size projections, that, that type of, of stuff, um, Michael folks at the time um, and I would, would collaborate and talk about um, what we thought that the run was doing. And, and we were very much in agreement. Um, we were using, we shared data and everything. So um, yeah, so I, I think that's, that's pretty important um, as far as making sure that we each have the, the same data sets to use. And, um, and it's, it was good that we were coming up with similar answers. <laughs> um, but anyway, so yeah, just reiterating that it was uh, very collaborative this year. And I'm, I'm hoping that's, that we continue that in the future to meet um, weekly um, to make sure that we're providing the best information possible. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Fred. Uh, and uh, we'll go back to Canadian panel member Tim Gerberding and uh, also I'll provide an opportunity for other uh, panel member discussion as well. But uh, we'll start. Uh, Again, back with you, Tim. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I'll uh, keep this short so as to give others the opportunity. But you know, I think that this information exchange and providing heads up is excellent. And um, you know, certainly don't want to blast anyone. I can see that there's you know good rapport among the managers. But I think that you know providing information and providing heads ups is short of what is envisioned in the agreement here. I mean, shall make recommendations to the management entities. I mean, this is a fairly meaty requirement, you know, making recommendations, looking at 17, uh, reviewing the performance and uh, making recommendations for improving management performance. That goes beyond merely providing heads up and exchanging information in my view. I mean, that might apply to things like uh, establishing, you know, thresholds at which uh, certain management actions take place, timing. I mean, uh, I, I recall back in 2019, and the date may not be exactly right, but as per my recollection, um, in Y5, uh, the, uh, the restriction on uh, six inch mesh was lifted in, on, on something like the 15th of August, uh, 2019 on the assumption that the fish that were coming were all chum. And so, I, I mean, in, in my view, that was 
uh, not appropriate given the state of the uh, of the Chinook run. And, and, and those may be bad examples, but just to say that, you know, we've got a proactive direction here to make recommendations, to review performance and try to make recommendations to improve things. Uh, I recognize that in season, you know, uh, people have to are, are operating by the by the, their boot heels and, and can't do things too quickly but but if preseason there were talk there was discussion about you know thresholds when certain management actions would take place I, I think that's more in in really the spirit of what's in the agreement here I mean it's great to exchange information heads up and all of that but 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 I still believe that we're falling short of what was envisioned in the agreement here Thank you, uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, and uh, you know, excellent point. I think that uh, you know, before we go to other panel members, uh, very important to highlight that uh, there are, are different responsibilities and uh, let's call it required actions that the Yukon River Salmon Agreement assigns to the Yukon River panel versus the uh, the parties, and by extension, the parties being the uh, the management entities. So it's important to to differentiate between the two, um, but certainly certainly do agree that the Yukon River panel does have a, a responsibility in uh, that advisory capacity in, in providing a uh, coordinated recommendation to the management uh, entities uh, around the uh, the management of salmon. So perhaps we'll go to U.S. Uh, panel member Andy Bassich. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Co-Chair. Um, you know, I think I think the reason why this is maybe such a difficult topic is that there's a, a misperception, or maybe it's a perception issue. Um, I, I I have a lot of faith in U.S. managers, but I think what our biggest problem is is geographics. When you look at the length of the Yukon River, when you look where our first major assessment is, uh, several hundred miles upriver, and then um, the ability to, to get any kind of a reaction or check on that assessment is at this point in time, right at the Canadian border at Eagle, just about. So there's a lot of time that goes on but, uh, between these two official checkpoints, but I think our managers try and do a pretty good job of, of um, soliciting information from fishers in season and trying to react to that. And I think they, we have come so far in the ability to surgically manage this fisheries on the Alaskan side. Unfortunately, there are years uh, that happen like this year in the Chinook run where fish just disappeared. They didn't show up and nobody could have accounted for that through any kind of management recommendation or whatever. Nobody even realized it was happening until the season was just about over. And likewise with the fall jump, it was realized much quicker and actions were taken place uh, as quickly as possible. Um, you know, you mentioned a lot of the, the fisheries in 5YD. Well, a lot of it was shut down. The vast majority of it was uh, before the fish even arrived. It's just because, as, as was explained earlier, um, the, the length and the distance, the vastness of that one unit and the fact that there are 100% Canadian origin fish it looks a little bit bad on paper. And that's always a problem that I've had is, is when you just count numbers, it's, it doesn't always reflect what takes place in reality. But I have a lot of faith in, in the cooperation of the managers. Uh, I think we've done a lot. I, uh, I'm not saying that we can't improve, but I think the biggest factor involved in why we have these issues with not meeting escapement goals some years is simply the geographics of the fisheries, the vast distances, and the time it takes to actually have confirmation that one thing or another is happening. I think our managers take a pretty cautious approach. And um, some years they, they're spot on, some years are a little bit off, but I think in any, in any human endeavor, you're gonna have human error involved. Uh, and I don't think any of it's intentional. It's just one of those things that you have to accept 
in any kind of human endeavor. So I'm not, I'm not making excuses. I agree with you, Tim. I think it, anything that we can do to improve management is a good thing. What's been on my mind a lot is that most of these things that are affecting whether we achieve escapement goals or not are many, many times things that we don't have control of as far as humans go. Climate change, not knowing the impacts of climate change. Ichnia phonus, not knowing the impacts of that ahead of time. We don't, we don't monitor for that at the mouth of the river. So there are these things that we have no control over. And those are the things that oftentimes are, are contributing to why we don't meet an escapement goal one year or why we may have over escapement the next year. So I'm just trying to give us some perspective on this. Um, I have a lot of faith in our managers. Um, I think everybody involved tries to do the best they can. And I think we've come a long way. Uh, I'm very much open to trying new ideas. Um, my personal preferences, I think we should build a little bit of a buffer into our management, but that, that's something we'd have to discuss um, and try and figure out. But um, yeah, it's mostly geographical and that, and that gives a perception that we are not managing well, when in fact, there's really nothing you can do about it because of the vastness of the Yukon River distance wise and assessment tool wise. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Great, uh, thank you for that, uh, Andy, and uh, a lot of excellent points. Uh, I think perhaps one, one point I can raise before we go to uh, uh, more uh, questions from Canadian panel members is that uh, from, a, from a Yukon River panel perspective, uh, we have implemented uh, an important change recently, uh, in fact, uh, signified through the timing of this meeting to improve upon the panel's abilities to uh, exercise, if you will, uh, its responsibilities around uh, recommendations. And, and specifically what I'm referring to is that uh, many panel members will recall that in, in prior years, the post-season meeting has been held uh, within the calendar year that fisheries occurred, so typically in early December. And the timing of the Yukon River Panel's postseason meeting uh, in accordance with that schedule often resulted in a situation where uh, not all of the uh, fishery harvest and management uh, information was compiled and available for, for panel members' uh, consideration at that time. And essentially, the result was that uh, the Yukon River Panel would receive a partial postseason report at its postseason meeting and then a complete postseason report at its preseason meeting, which uh, I think as, as panel members can recognize firsthand, uh, that did create some challenges with regards to having adequate opportunity to consider uh, the effectiveness uh, of different management strategies implemented in the uh, prior year with an eye towards uh, developing and, and uh, providing recommendations for management measures for the coming year. So, just wanted to point that out, that the, uh, the timing of this year's uh, Yukon River uh, panel post-season meeting uh, is, uh, is something that was intentionally structured to occur uh, in the January timeframe. Uh, this was planned uh, well, well in advance of the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic situation. So just wanted to make that clear that that was a, a conscious effort on the part of of the co-chairs and the, the Pacific Salmon Commission to, uh, to make those arrangements. And hopefully uh, this new approach provides panel members with a, an improved opportunity to again, receive uh, fulsome information in a timely manner in order to uh, effectively be able to uh, exercise a number of the uh, authorities and responsibilities with respect to management recommendations as set out within the Yukon River Salmon Agreement. So uh, with that, we'll go to uh, Canadian panel member questions, and uh, not sure if it's um, Roger or, or Al or Carl, uh, you'd like to provide some thoughts uh, on this topic? Sure. Thank you, Steve. It's Al calling. Um, as some of you know, I have had a mixed role over my uh, career, both with the Yukon um, DFO and also with the Yukon Salmon Subcommittee. And uh, 
I'd like to, I would really like to um, compliment the um, agency people that have been working in the past couple of years. I've seen a, a real, um, I've seen a real convergence of interests in doing that, and I think that's, and I think that's a that's a, a very good thing. But unfortunately, uh, or whatever, the the thing is that a lot of the work that you're doing that you're doing so well is kind of hidden from us as the Yukon Family Subcommittee, so that uh, we do receive some updates from URFA, et cetera, and we do uh, get some from DFO. But uh, certainly this summer uh, or this past season, uh, we had to we considered we had to move quite quite quickly in requesting that the First Nations cut down on their uh, fisheries that they use more conservation methods than they perhaps had choose on doing. Um, I think that worked out quite well in that I would suspect. Um, if the agency tried to do it, it would have to go through Ottawa or some, something similar. So I think we worked in a coordination method. But what I would like to have you think about is a means by which uh, not only the members of the JTC or whatever, but the Yukon Salmon Subcommittee and perhaps uh, equivalent groups in, in, the, uh, in Alaska are informed of, of what may become emerging issues a little bit sooner so that we have a little bit more time to act. Um, and we also have, uh, I don't want to call it the problem, well it's a problem for me because I grew up in the old system where uh, you did not take holidays in the summertime and there was a, an expectation that your job was more important than your personal life was, but there's been an inversion of that where a lot of people uh, consider that their personal life, particularly when they move forward in their career and move into decision-making uh, positions, they consider that their personal life is, is more important than their professional life. Um, it's even in you know collective agreements and that sort of thing, so I'm not just speaking over, off the top of my head, but there have to be the ability to uh, have people on site that are able to make the decisions and are able to communicate it to communicate those decisions to ourselves and others. So just something to think about. Uh, we're moving socially, culturally. We're in a changing environment, and we can't continue to do things the way we used to do it in the past. We have to modify our uh, behavior in order to reflect those new realities. So just something to think about. And thank you very much. Thank you for those comments. Uh, maybe Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Co-Chair. So um, I guess some additional comments to add to this and, and you know, reference back to um, some of your initial um, explanation, uh, Mr. Co-Chair, um, of, you know, in reference to the agreement language that um, it's the panel um, that uh, shall make recommendations to the management entities and then there's more or less a separate process for those management entities that's for the coordination and taking into account um, the recommendations of the panel um, in both adopting of regulations um, and enforcement of those regulations so there's kind of two different processes um, that uh, flow um, in in that way um, and I also want to recognize and, and highlight that when it comes to panel making recommendations that the, the process that um, uh, the panel of two bilateral sections of a US and Canadian section, um, when it comes to making those recommendations um, that are brought bilaterally together, that that's a discussion that occurs at, at the section level, uh, reaching a con consensus um, within each section to bring forward for bilateral consideration, um, and then finalizing um, uh, recommendations to the management entities from the panel. And obviously, that's the process that I think, certainly in my time and my involvement with the Yukon River panel that's been followed um, consistently on an annual basis, and we'll certainly be moving into that um, process leading up to this next um, preseason meeting in April. Uh, but one of the main things I wanted to highlight is that um, it's it's a scale issue as well. I really appreciate 
um, all panel members' perspectives and comments that have been brought to bear on this topic. But um, the scale of in-season management, as an example, that just I'm going to focus on just Alaska, is that um, we have a wealth of, of regulations, both at the state and the federal level, um, in particular at the federal level when it comes to federal subsistence regulations um, that um, prescribe, for lack of a better term, um, uh, how managers are to implement um, their annual management strategies. Those are frequently changing regulations, especially on the state side through the Board of Fisheries process. Um, and that's the mechanism uh, in the component of the management entities um, taking into account recommendations of the panel and adoption of regulations. That's absolutely been happening in, in recent years. Um, the Board of Fisheries in particular has always been curious at, at most and uh, wanting to hear um, from um, staff primarily about um, the panel interactions um, and, and so on and so forth. And I, I would say very safely that um, many of our rec regulations at the state level um, are taking into account almost in parallel um, many of the directions and perspectives that um, the Yukon River panel um, has brought to the equation in the form of recommendations over time. Are they exactly consistent with expectations of each individual section or even in each individual panel member? Perhaps not. And I think that goes to Andy's comments about perception um, or expectation in that regard. Uh, but um, there is a process that admittedly is, is probably behind the scenes. Um, it's very difficult to observe because it happens over time and it happens amongst many different entities, organizations, and groups. Trying to combine all of those um, into a um, coherent process that even US and Canadian section panel members are engaged on is would be a, a challenge uh, to, to say the least. Um, and that's just taking into account, say, regulatory processes. When we're talking about the daily in-season um, evaluation and of run assessment and decision making based on those, those regulatory guides in the way of regulations, um, that's even at a higher level of trying to uh, coordinate that. I'll give one brief example that um, the U.S. section of the Yukon River Panel also serves as what we call the Yukon Advisory Group, um, that um, we will schedule meetings, teleconferences, uh, on occasion, uh, on an in-season basis with our Yukon Advisory Group, our U.S. section members, some of which are not always able to attend. Uh, but not on a, on a every time there's significant management decisions to be made, but when there's something pretty big that we want to seek that guidance and input from our um, YAG, so to speak, we will try and schedule those meetings that still takes a couple of days in advance uh, notice um, to um, even uh, bring to the equation. Um, so even at that level, at that scale, um, just within Alaska in our existing U.S. section, it's simply not possible for all of our U.S. section members to be um, even a fly on the wall, for lack of a better term, of the daily and hourly, in many cases, evaluation and decision-making processes that are occurring. Uh, so there's there's layers and levels and complexity um, when it comes to just on the Alaska side that I imagine is very is mimicked in some form on the Canadian side as well that um, beyond the way that the panel has been making management recommendations for for since it's since the signing of the agreement and even prior to that of getting into much more detail um, it may not be possible it doesn't mean just like Andy said there isn't room for improvement thinking outside of the box a little bit and I'm certainly open to that and having discussions of that but um, there's a lot of challenges and and it may not be realistic um, in managing expectations of what could result. Hey, Mr. Co-Chair, uh, extremely helpful context uh, there and again emphasizing the importance of the Yukon River Panel's preseason and, and postseason meetings in 
uh, considering and developing informed perspectives on uh, on uh, development of, of recommendations. Uh, but uh, go to Canadian panel member Dennis Zimmerman. Uh, go ahead, Dennis. Actually, I'm just a conduit to Carl. I guess they're having hand raising issues. Carl Sidney wanted to speak. Thank you, my friend. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. <clears throat> And thank you, Tim Gerberding, for uh, leading this um, agenda item off. Um, 20 years ago, maybe less than that, we, we had a, we began having the Yukon River panel meetings and we also decided that we could have them in communities. I feel that that is a huge disconnect. We were supposed to be, according to our agreement, but to work cooperatively and collectively make decisions. We were to be able to meet with the people that, the grassroots people, the people that depend on the fishery, the Chinook salmon and chum. That's been lost. That's the way I feel right now. The managers have, have changed over 20 years and we have different managers and I feel that a lot of the managers have not had the opportunity to be out in the communities and, and to see the people that actually use this as a food on their table. I feel that that, that is a huge disconnect. I bet probably 10, five, 10 years ago, I'll bet you any money if we decided that we will not have any more panel meetings, that we'll just have them virtually by telephone, I would have probably got the answer saying, oh, that's impossible. But here we are, forced into it because of an epidemic. I think that once we get back on our feet and open the doors and open the borders, I feel that it's, uh, it's very important for us to be able to meet in the communities. It doesn't matter about the expense but it's so important, and I witnessed this from our teleconferences, that just the grassroots people that pay the, pay the price when we do closures, and, and they're the ones that don't have an income, they're the ones that don't have food on the table, they're the ones that depend on this food throughout the winter, and to be able to get a little bit of money to, to put gas in their fuel tanks and to be able to go hunting and be able to go get berries. They're the ones that pay the price for our decision making. And I think we're going to have to seriously have a look at that and go back to that way. I'm not going to be on this board forever. Al indicated to me this morning that we're not here forever. And we better set a precedent for the future people that are coming behind us. Thank you. Carl, um, appreciate uh, appreciate you sharing that that context and that perspective. Uh, we'll just uh, do a quick check. Uh, other comments or perspectives from panel members. Uh, topic. Uh, Eric, uh, I believe Eric Weingarth. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, this is Eric in St. Mary's. Um, all of you have had very good points, and I'm um, definitely thinking hard about uh, what you've all said. But we've stayed so focused on what comes in the river and counting fish coming up the river, and, and I feel like we're still missing uh, a lot of info on um, the out migration of, of, of salmon. Are they not? I mean, are recruits per spawner? We didn't even talk about that today. Um, we should have had a, a, a decent run returning, but it didn't. And to me, there's something going on on the fish returning or out in the ocean that's getting worse and worse. Um, and that's that's what I'm having a hard time thinking about um, how we're funding these projects too. We need to be uh, keeping an eye on, on these fish going out, out. Maybe they're not making it out. And maybe that's why it's getting worse. So. Anyhow, I appreciate you guys uh, listening. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you for that uh, perspective and your and your comments, uh, Eric. Okay. So with that, uh, not seeing any further comments uh, or questions from panel members, I'd like to uh, express our appreciation. I think uh, we may have one other comment. Uh, I see someone's come off uh, mute. Uh, is that uh, uh, hello, Agnar uh, Alstrom? Go ahead. Hello? Uh, hello. Yeah. Who do we have on the line? Otis Sibri from St. Mary's. I agree with Eric. Uh, somebody's got to be watching the ocean or keeping track of the Bering Sea. They've been overfishing down there. It's not just hurting the people here on the Yukon. It's hurting the animals also. We're not managing it right, I think. Uh, somebody's got to do something about the overfishing down in the Bering Sea. Uh, a lot of whales have been chasing in the fish, even coming up the Yukon, because there's barely any fish out there being overfished. And that's what I wanted to say. Great. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, yeah, I think uh, as a it's a good conversation uh, for the panel to have at this point, again, reflecting on uh, information that's been shared at this meeting on the management measures that were implemented in 2020 and the resulting effect. So again, understanding that context and uh, hopefully the, uh, the adjustments that we've made to the, the panel's annual meeting cycle will help uh, position panel members to have uh, an informed discussion at the 2021 preseason meeting uh, towards development of, uh, of management recommendations for the coming season. So with that, uh, perhaps we'll, we'll uh, conclude, but recognize that con uh, continuation of our discussion around recommendations and coordinated management uh, will continue at the 2021 preseason meeting. So uh, we'll transition now to our next item on the agenda. Uh, and so we've got a few items here pertaining to the Yukon River Salmon Restoration and Enhancement Fund. And we'll start with a review and update on 2020 projects funded through the Restoration and Enhancement Fund. And I'll invite uh, Tom Alp from the Pacific uh, Salmon Commission, who serves as the Yukon River uh, Salmon Restoration and Enhancement Fund Manager. Uh, Tom? Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Let's bring up the presentation. So the purpose of this agenda item is to give you an overview of the status of the restoration and enhancement fund projects funded through 2020. And just to give you a, a sense of where they've got to recognizing that the uh, project reports will, will come in in full, mostly uh, still in a couple of months time, and then will be made available on the UK River Panel website. Um, noting that uh, this file as well is available on the on the website for download and uh, panel members, you'll have a copy in your pack and you, you will largely have had an opportunity to review it as well. Um, I will focus my comments uh, on, first of all, some of the projects uh, which have been deferred, some of the projects which have gone ahead this year, but with slightly amended methods and as well as uh, some projects where I have updates, uh, which I received after sharing this file with you and which are therefore not reflected in this, in this pack in full. Um, and I just want to say that I'm very grateful to all of the people involved in running projects this year who, who got me updates uh, that you have before you um, in, in quite a short notice. So uh, my thanks to that and uh, where there are projects which aren't noted here, um, then that's uh, in, in, in no way um, on the proponents. That's, that's down to me. Um, and the other thing I just want to note as well is that as I go through and uh, read out some of the titles for these projects as well, um, I apologize in advance for any uh, mispronunciations I may make. I in no way intend any disrespect by that if I do make any errors. So 
First of all, on this slide, uh, you have uh, three of the four projects uh, referenced which have been completed. And I should note that when I say completed, I mean completed administratively from, from my perspective and um, my colleague uh, Victor's perspective. So uh, many of the projects that are noted as ongoing in this report will have conducted their field work by now and will be finishing their reporting. Uh, but we consider a project to be concluded once it's submitted that report uh, to us and the financials and we've uh, settled any grants that need to be paid and, and closed the file. So looking at these uh, first three, as I say, I won't comment and uh, kind of read the notes out in detail, um, but these projects went, went largely as planned. And moving on now to slide two, fourth completed project, uh, the White Horse Rapids Fishway Stewardship Project. Uh, it was also a very successful project this year, I think, reading through the report. Uh, even though the fishway was closed, the, um, the staff that were recruited uh, to that project uh, were engaged in a lot of really interesting and, uh, and certainly very important activities. Moving to slide three. I'll spend a, a couple more moments on this slide because these are the projects which I referred to in my financial report to you yesterday, which have been conditionally deferred. So they were meant to happen in 2020, uh, reviewed and approved by the panel to go ahead in 2020, and um, for, for different reasons, but all essentially on, on account of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, were unable to proceed as planned. So these projects are the, the Fishing Branch River Chum Instream Egg Incubation Trial, second year, the Tatchin Creek Chinook Enumeration Project, the Nacho Nayak Dun Salmon Planning Initiative, Porcupine River Chum Harvest Guideline Community Signage Project, and a project aimed at promoting the chum salmon angling fisheries. So for the uh, first of those projects, the Fishing Branch Project, um, that looks like it was going to be able to uh, proceed operationally, um, but this project has a complementary funding source, which is very important, the Polar Continental Shelf Program, which was going to uh, provide the project with helicopter support. And because the Polar Continental Shelf Program um, as an organization was, was affected by COVID and had to suspend their operations, um, that complementary funding dropped out. That meant the project as a whole couldn't go ahead. And unfortunately, uh, the project wasn't able to secure an alternative funding source uh, with the notice that, that they had. Um, so consequently, uh, that project was uh, conditionally deferred by the Yukon River Panel co-chairs to 2021, meaning that if it is able to go ahead this year and it is able to secure the complementary funding that it needs, um, then, then that will happen. And coming down to the other four, um, the the process by which those um, has, have been uh, conditionally deferred is very similar in that uh, for each of these projects, the proponents uh, got in touch with, with myself or my colleague Victor at some point and said, we're not going to be able to go ahead this year. Um, do we need to resubmit our applications to the restoration and, and, and enhancement fund through the call for proposals process? And the uh, response is that uh, the decision by the co-chairs was that um, it wasn't necessary to do that. They've been reviewed by the panel already. They've been scrutinized and have been assessed as being projects that, that should go ahead. And uh, they will receive conditional deferrals as well. So you won't see them in your R&E packs for 2021, um, but those projects uh, will go ahead again if at the time when you meet to make final decisions, uh, your assessment is that it appears that they will be able to go ahead as planned Moving now on to slide four. This slide uh, indicates the one project that was canceled outright. Um, and the reason for that is, again, it wasn't able to go ahead as planned in 2020. So this is the Teslin Tlingit uh, Salmon Steward project. Um, but the good news is that it hasn't been canceled full stop forever. Um, that position can now be funded internally going forward. And that's why, again, you haven't seen a submission for that this year in, in the R&E fund. 
Moving now to slide five. These projects I'll just comment on uh, quite briefly in order to move through the, um, the presentation. These are projects which are underway, um, but with amendments to their methodology. So for the first project, uh, the genetic stock identification of subsistence harvests within the coastal district and district one of the Yukon River. Uh, initially, uh, at the start of the project, the proponents uh, got in touch and advised that um, they'd like to change the methodology so that instead of uh, traveling into communities to recruit samplers and train them, uh, they'd like to do that remotely. And, and that amendment was approved by the co-chairs. Uh, subsequently, in the fall, once the uh, field work had been completed, uh, it was determined that a very low number of samples had been obtained from one of the districts. And as a result, the uh, project scope and, and the objectives and expected outcomes were, were amended. Uh, the proponents asked for approval to continue with the analysis on the basis that it would still be useful, um, just not for the original objectives. And again, the co-chair has decided that the project should go ahead on that basis and collect the information that it can. And second, uh, of course, I'm conscious as I'm going through this that uh, many of the people on the line today are project proponents involved in running these projects. Uh, and so uh, I apologize for the oversimplifications that I may be making to the, to the progress that, that you've made so far this year. Um, but the second project on this slide is the Yukon River Salmon Summer pre-season preparation meeting uh, for 2020. And of course, this project uh, normally involves a, a large face-to-face -face gathering um, that couldn't go ahead, um, but a, a teleconference was arranged in its place. That took place on May 12th and uh, got a, a good level of participation. I attended that as well. I, I learned a lot, so enjoyed that. Um, and then the, the project this year uh, also therefore had funds available to hold an additional post-season meeting um, which took place on de December the 17th. Moving now on to slide six. These are the projects that are ongoing, again, from an administrative perspective. Uh, as a general comment, I'll make, um, we'll go through these according to the, the funding categories. So starting with some of the conservation oriented projects. A general comment I'll make um, is that as I was reviewing the, the interim reports, um, many, of, many of the projects that did go ahead this year have been technically successful, um, but it was really noticeable uh, reading through all, all the different projects that, uh, that the low runs, of course, have had an impact as well as high water levels uh, in some cases. Um, and that's had a, a effects on a, a, lot of, a lot of the projects. Um, for example, those projects involving sampling um, have often not been able to, to get the sample numbers that they're anticipating. Uh, and those projects seeking to collect brood stock, for example, um, have had difficulties in, in the most part collecting brood stock. So this is just a general comment on the projects. Um, the first two on this slide, of course, you, you heard about yesterday as, as well, the Klondike River Chinook Sonar Project and the Pelly River Chinook Salmon Sonar Program. Um, and, and they were, again, technically successful this year. So they were implemented according to plan. Um, for the uh, third project as well, the genetic stock identification of pilot station uh, Chinook salmon. Again, that, that, that essentially was implemented according to plan. Moving on to the remainder of those uh, conservation projects. And this is a slide I'll spend a little time on because um, I comment at the start about having some additional updates that I can briefly share with you um, that aren't reflected in the written pack at this time. Um, two of these projects are, are, are those sorts of projects. So the first one, uh, Chinook Salmon Sonar Enumeration on the Big Salmon River. Um, that project was successfully implemented uh, and it came up with an interpolate, interpolated estimate of 1,634 uh, Chinook passing, um, which was the second lowest escapement that has been recorded uh, by, that, by that monitoring program. The second project on this slide, uh, Juvenile Chinook Salmon Outmigration at the Yukon 
river mouth uh, that was also successfully implemented. Uh, sampling was a little delayed, um, but it went smoothly once it was underway. And uh, we can expect the full report for that in by about April 30th, as indicated here. So we move now to slide eight. Moving on to some of the restoration projects. And uh, some of these are, are the projects that I made a general comment about um, uh, in terms of being affected by uh, low brood stocks. So the first project, uh, Tang Huat Chang Council uh, Fox Creek Salmon Restoration Project, again, largely successful. The second project, Deadman Creek Chinook Salmon Restoration Project, again, overall technically successful, uh, but it was affected by uh, the low availability of, of brood stock um, for, for elements of that program. And the, for the Klondike River Chinook in-stream incubation trial, um, a project involving quite a number of components, uh, surveys were completed, um, but the, the brood stock and eggplant component couldn't happen again for a lack of brood stock. Um, but the other activities such as the plan to develop a, a restoration plan uh, are underway. I uh, come down to slide nine now. In continuing with restoration projects, I do have an update on the Mika Creek Chinook restoration investigation that I can share with you verbally. Um, so the plans there to complete a, a Chinook in-stream egg incubation study on Mika Creek were not possible due to the low return and high water levels. Uh, two aerial spawning surveys did take place. Um, there was poor visibility, high turbulence in the water, uh, which unfortunately did result, or at least would have contributed to, to no fish being observed. Um, upcoming work includes a winter survey of Mika Creek uh, to provide more information on the suitability of planting locations for uh, potential future in-stream egg incubation work. And uh, work is also going to take place to uh, put together a restoration plan for Mika Creek as well. Uh, the project at the bottom of the slide, Tay River Chinook Salmon Access Project, I also have a verbal update to share which is that the project is, is proceeding. It's incurred some delays, uh, primarily again, due to COVID, the engineering firm that was initially contracted to assess the uh, fish barrier identified there can, can do the work had to be um, substituted for, for another firm. Um, and so far attempts to identify a, a long-term funding source for this project, um, as I understand it, have, have not been successful. Slide 10. Um, project being run by um, one of our panel members on the line today. Um, again, this project is going well. Apologize uh, to, to Dennis, who um, provided a couple of slight updates to this, uh, which I wasn't able to incorporate in, in time in the version that went through. Um, but uh, I think that although his, his tweaks to the text were an improvement on my, on my summary, essentially what you have in front of you is accurate. And slide 11. So here we have the uh, Yukon River salmon pre-season uh, preparation meeting. Of course, this is a project which is approved in a slightly different cycle and considered in a slightly different cycle to the rest of the projects normally, which is why you're seeing it twice in this presentation. So previously I was referring to the uh, project which was uh, 2019 project referring to the work that took place in 2020. Uh, here you have the, the plans for the coming pre-season meeting and just worth saying that the current plan is for a face-to-face -face meeting to happen if that is possible and uh, the Yukon River Drainage Fisheries Association will keep a close eye on that and uh, provide updates if, if it appears that alternative uh, methods for that meeting should be used. And finally, for the, the last program that we're mentioning here, uh, Enhanced Education and Outreach Salmon in the Schools, um, I was really pleased to, to receive an update from uh, Rivers to Ridges who are running this program. 
development here that it, it appears to be going really well, uh, taking into account some of the learning from previous years. I know that uh, that's an organisation uh, as you know that, that, that has uh, had a hard year trying to provide educational programmes. So it's really good to hear that, uh, that this, this programme is going well. Um, and finally, just wrapping up this presentation, concluding, I just want to express my gratitude to uh, all of the proponents involved in r and &E projects. I know it's been an extremely difficult year, as we've heard, and you don't need me to comment on that particularly, but I'm just very grateful for everyone for keeping us up to date with their projects and for doing what they can to adapt and to, and to keep this work going. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the update, Tom, and uh, I guess uh, formally welcoming you to the uh, Yukon River Panel Annual Meeting Cycle. I know this is your, your first time working through it, so uh, just wanted to uh, convey uh, our appreciation and thanks for compiling the 2020 Restoration and Enhancement Fund project update for us. And uh, perhaps I'll ask uh, if there are any questions from panel members on the 2020 Restoration and Enhancement Fund project update. If I may very quickly, Mr. Co-Chair, um, I'd like to uh, reiterate the same sentiment of welcome, Tom, um, to to the Yukon River panel process. And thank you for uh, um, not too much detail, but a good run through of the existing 2020 projects. I know many uh, comments from uh, some of our members uh, may be looking for some more detail from time to time. So thank you for a good presentation. Okay, so with that, uh, not seeing any uh, hands up, we will then uh, progress to our next Restoration and Enhancement Fund uh, presentation, uh, which is a update on the 2021 Restoration and Enhancement Fund uh, program. And uh, calling on Tom again uh, to, uh, to walk us through uh, this, uh, this next and, and final presentation uh, of, uh, of the afternoon. Thank you very much. And just while I'm loading that, I just want to say that it's a, a, a very much a privilege and, and a pleasure to be involved in supporting uh, your process in a, in, a, in a modest way. So thank you for those words of welcome as well. So in this presentation, I'm just going to summarize the process that has been uh, implemented this year for the call for proposals for the Restoration and Enhancement Fund for projects uh, seeking funding in, in 2021 this year. And I'll just run through the, the call for proposals and uh, near-term priorities, confirming uh, what those were. Um, I'll give you a, an overview of the, the number of project proposals that were submitted for consideration this year. And, uh, and we'll just touch on the joint technical committee review process and um, public review comments. And I should also say at the end, uh, we'll confirm if there are comments from the panel as well uh, to be advanced to proponents. So moving to slide two. This slide is to confirm that the call for proposals for 2021 projects was posted on the Yukon River panel website on May 26th, 2020 with a deadline of October 1st, which is the normal deadline for this process. And uh, we issued a reminder as well to proponents that had applied in the previous year, two weeks prior to that deadline. Um, and we received all of our proposals in a, in a timely manner this year. So thank you to everyone for that. Um, and I included a graphic here just to um, serve as a, as, as, a, as a reminder of the information that is posted as part of that call for proposals. So you have the call for proposals document itself detailing the near-term priorities and the details of the process, um, the r and &E fund priorities plan, the forms that proponents are required to complete and submit, uh, and then the project proposal scoring criteria as well, um, explaining how the joint te technical committee will uh, review proposals and uh, reach a bilateral uh, consensus score. Then there's specific guidance for sonar proposals and for stock restoration proposals, and as well uh, communications proposals. Um, so if you, if you are a member of the public and you're and, or someone who's a potentially proponent and you're uh, watching this presentation today, I do certainly encourage you to um, to, to look, look through that material uh, if you're considering preparing a proposal in the future. Uh, slide three. 
This is just to confirm that the near-term priorities that uh, went into the 2021 call were consistent with the previous call um, and to say that they didn't change. Um, so I won't go through those uh, in detail now, but we can come back to the slide if there are any questions on that. And now moving to slide four, I'll just give you a summary of, of some of the numbers for the project proposals uh, that were submitted for consideration. So slide four shows you the proposals, or summarizes the number of proposals that were submitted through the R&E call for proposals process this year. So these numbers correspond to the proposals um, that, that you panel members will see in the 2021 packs that have been distributed to you this year. Um, one thing I should draw attention to on the slide is that we receive proposals requesting funds in US dollars and in Canadian dollars. So the exchange rate has an impact on the total amount that is requested each year. And here the exchange rate um, is 0.75. And that's because this is the exchange rate back in October uh, when these proposals were received, processed and distributed onwards uh, to yourselves. And so I, I did it that way so that the numbers would align with the figures um, that you may have uh, summarizing the proposals that, that you received and have looked at. Now we'll move on to slide five. And this slide is perhaps more useful because it adds in the uh, summary numbers for the five additional projects that we saw in the previous presentation that have been conditionally deferred from 2020 to 2021. So this shows you a total of 28 proposals uh, requesting approximately 1.4 million US dollars, again at that 0.75 exchange rate. I do want to provide two verbal updates to the figures presented on this slide. Um, first, in hindsight, if I were preparing this slide again, uh, then I think it would be more helpful to uh, consider this at a 0.78 exchange rate, as that's the uh, more quite stable current exchange rate. And it's the one that I used in the financial update that I provided to you yesterday. Um, so if we take that bottom line figure, that uh, 1.4 million, and we calculate it with that updated exchange rate, then we get a slightly higher number um, of, of requests on the table in terms of uh, the financial request of about 1.448 million dollars as US dollars. And then second, should also note that since the educational exchange program was developed and considered through a process slightly separate to the R main r and &E process this year, uh, this slide doesn't include the funding requested by the educational exchange program. Of course, uh, as of yesterday, that has now been uh, bilaterally approved and it's something we also need to account for in, in these figures. So uh, my apologies that this figure isn't on your slide. Um, as I was, are these figures accurate as I was going through my, my notes to prepare what I wanted to convey to you today, I realized that uh, in hindsight, um, though these, these are correct, they're not the most useful figures I could have provided you with. Um, but if we include it, uh, then this slide would show you that we have four communications projects for a total of 29 projects requesting approximately US $1,518,000. So that is the total ask. And um, the question that I think you, you want to get at here is uh, how does that ask compare to the funds that we're likely to have at our disposal for 2021 projects? So if we do that, and again, these figures aren't on those slides um, and we account for the commitments and conditional commitments uh, that, that you have in administration fees, then what I can say now, just to give you a sense of this, um, is that if all of those conditionally deferred 2020 projects go ahead and accounting for the educational exchange and accounting for administration fees, um, then the difference between the total ask of those 29 projects of the R&E fund in 2021 and the amount that we anticipate will be available at the moment is likely to be in the region of 170,000 US dollars. Um, now I'm sure that US section members will recall that um, I was asked to provide a brief verbal update on this during your 
uh, preparatory meetings that, that we were setting up and uh, supporting earlier in the week. The figure I gave there was, was $100,000, the difference now being that I'm accounting for that approved educational exchange program as of yesterday in that figure as well. Um, I did consider briefly a, a second scenario here, which I think is also useful to consider to give you a, a, an estimate on, on the range. If, if those conditionally deferred projects were not to go ahead, um, if, if an assessment were to be made that um, COVID restrictions would still prevent implementation in 2021, which of course we hope won't be the case, um, then that difference would be reduced to about 16,000 US dollars. So I think the actual figure um, will end up falling somewhere between those two estimates. And it will depend on whether those conditionally deferred projects are able to go ahead. Um, it will depend on the amount that currently active projects end up spending uh, once they submit their um, their final statement of financial expenditures, and it will depend on the exchange rate. So I wouldn't worry too much about that figure for now, but the headline message that I want to give you is that you are unlikely to find yourself in a situation uh, where you can fund everything. Um, and as is normally the case, a degree of prioritization will be required when it comes to selecting the projects to fund in 2021. And an update to those figures will be provided to you when you meet in April. So, um, so thank you for bearing with me there. Um, as I say, I'm sorry that these figures aren't on the slides you have in front of you for reference. Um, but I did, uh, in hindsight, when I was thinking about what was important to, to, to cover in this presentation, um, I did want to make sure that uh, I gave you a, a sense of that, at least verbally. So slide six now um, compares the total number of requests, again, amending that 2021 uh, total of 28 to 29 to account for the educational exchange. It gives you a sense of um, the number of requests that have been received over the past six years, uh, both in terms of number of proposals and amount of funding. And uh, although I perhaps uh, labored the point there about the maths uh, describing the extent to which you may be oversubscribed, um, worth noting that uh, in the scheme of things, this is a normal situation and you've actually received a, a lower number of proposals than, uh, than in some previous years. Slide seven uh, refers to the, the Joint Technical Committee review. Um, conscious you heard from the co-chairs of the Joint Technical Committee yesterday um, who described the process that, that they went through. So um, this slide I've, I've just mentioned for the benefit of anyone who wasn't on the line yesterday just to confirm that, that this part of the process um, did take place um, and the uh, results of that review have been passed through to, uh, to, to, the, to both sections. Um, and the Joint Technical Committee didn't identify any requests for additional information or clarification um, for, for me to pass through, but they did provide uh, several thematic comments uh, for the panel's consideration. So uh, thank you very much to the Joint Technical Committee for um, for your work there. And then uh, finally on these slides, um, I'd like to draw it. Am I unmuted? We could hear you, Tom. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. Just got a notification. I think I know why. Uh, sorry, disregard that. Um, so the public uh, review opportunity is, is now open. So if you are um, a member of the public and you're, you're watching this presentation today and you're interested in knowing about the proposals that have been submitted uh, and that the panel will be uh, considering when they meet to make their final funding decisions uh, in the spring, um, then I invite you to uh, take a look at the Yukon River Panel website at, at www.yukonriverpanel.com. And if you navigate to uh, the r &E Fund tab there, um, then you will find um, a, a summary of how you can provide comments um, as well as a summary of all the proposals that have been submitted um, and the deadline if you would like to do that uh, please is, is March 31st this year. Um, so that's that's all I have. Um, at this point I'd like to uh, hand back to the co-chairs um, to advise if there are any uh, questions that the panel uh, would like to advance to um, proponents. Uh, regarding the, the 2021 proposals. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Tom, for the uh, the presentation. And uh, uh, to confirm, the the Yukon River panel will be advancing uh, three questions to project proponents uh, who have submitted proposals to the Restoration and Enhancement Fund in 2021. Uh, those questions will be specifically provided by the Pacific Salmon Commission Secretariat, Yukon River Panel, uh, Restoration and Enhancement Fund uh, Manager, and the deadline for proponents to respond to the three uh, Yukon River Panel questions will be set as March 1st, so uh, hopefully that will provide sufficient time for both response as well as uh, panel consideration. Before we go to panel member questions, I'll check with uh, Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, any additional comments on the 2021 Restoration and Enhancement Fund uh, process uh, summary? No additional questions. Maybe one more comment that um, um, there isn't an expectation when it comes to response uh, from proponents on the questions posed by the panel for the JTC to uh, review or comment um, upon those responses. That's all. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so with that, uh, we will go to panel member questions on the 2021 Restoration and Enhancement Fund uh, update. And we'll start with Canadian panel member uh, Alvon Finster. Go ahead. Oh, Carl, not and not uh, Al. Thank you, oh, Tom. No. Um, if you could go to slide four on your, I think it was slide four. It was the scheduling. Certainly, I'll just bring that back up. Sure. Thank you. My apologies, Carl. I could, should have just kept that active there, but uh, it's coming back up now. Uh, maybe the one before that. Not that one either. But anyway, it was the scheduling that we had laid out, the, the call for proposals and then the uh, the deadline, and then the actual application um, approval. I had uh, some some proponents and some contractors that did uh, that do work with the First Nations and in regard to working in the water and uh, around the water, mostly. They were saying that, wondering if there was some way that we could move that approval date to earlier date because they had trouble getting permits. Most of the time, uh, work has to take place in the summertime. And when they go work around in the water in creeks, they have to get permits from, say, Yesa, Yes, Ab or the water board, and uh, they just wondered if there was some way that we could possibly change those timelines to help accommodate them in their work. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Carl. Um, I may bounce this question uh, back to the two co-chairs uh, shamelessly, if, if I may. Co-chair, did you want to uh, respond? Uh, uh, yeah, I guess I, I maybe a follow-up question for Carl. Do Do you have a sense of uh, how much discrepancy is there? How much exact elapsed time of discrepancy between receipt of permits and uh, are we talking weeks, months? Um, uh, what What any any feedback on that, Carl? Well, I think probably even a couple of weeks would help. Um, I was told that sometimes. They were standing already in the creeks and on the telephone to ESAP to see if their application was approved or if they were allowed to go in and do the work. So I, I imagine even, even by two weeks would help. So I guess my, my only sentiment, I'm not sure that we have a, a good solution for the situation and to what extent other proponents um, may have run into similar issues in the past, but I do know that when we've had um, some issues um, where for practical purposes, not necessarily permitting in this example, 
um, that there has been a timing issue of, of final panel approval on proposals. Um, we've actually shifted the timeline. A, a classic example of this is the, um, um, the US preseason planning meeting. Uh, where we uh, essentially, even the proposal that's being presented currently in the current call um, is technically for next year, uh, next year's meeting. Now, in, in this example, that seems impractical given we're only talking about a couple of weeks. So my apologies if I don't have a good solution to the issue the proponents are encountering, but um, uh, I guess I'm open to um, maybe any other panel member comments uh, or from uh, from the co-chair, if there's some options that um, may be able to consider. Um, yeah, I, I think we might have a hard time this go round um, uh, to try and provide uh, earlier approval by a matter of weeks um, in this example, but uh, maybe there's some things that we can work with the proponent on um, to see what might be a, a better option for them um, to try and, and rectify that. Yeah, I wasn't, uh, Carl here again, thank you. I wasn't looking for uh, making the change for this season, but we do have to think about it in the future. Thank you. Uh, thanks uh, Thanks for those uh, comments, Carl. And certainly something that the, uh, the Yukon River panel members can put their minds to as we prepare for the 2021 preseason meeting, which is where the panel will also be developing its uh, its call for proposals for the 2022. Okay, so uh, we're at half past the hour, and I'm not seeing any further questions from panel members, and so we will proceed with the next item on our agenda. Uh, which is the provision of uh, testimony, public testimony. And we have a number of individuals who have registered to provide uh, testimony this afternoon. And so perhaps uh, can I pass it over to uh, you, Tom, to uh, coordinate uh, with Victor, uh, please? Thank you. Chair, uh, we have one, one comment from one of the members here in the room. Uh, sure. Uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, who's uh, speaking? I just want to comment on um, the importance of um, how contemporary and traditional knowledge tools work together. You know, the sonars play an important contemporary tool to um, management alongside of our traditional tools. And what it does is it forecasts runs of our salmon. They really assist. <clears throat> there is a harvest opportunity. These all come under um, the Yukon River funding process, especially uh, um, tributaries to the Yukon River where, where uh, Sonars not put up, and, and it makes it difficult for uh, harvesters to see if they can um, harvest salmon for that year or that season. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you for that uh, comment. Uh, it was uh, Canadian panel member Roger Alfred. Uh, appreciate that. So. With that, uh, we will now move into the opportunity for public testimony and uh, back over to Tom from the Pacific Salmon Commission Secretariat. Uh, go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Co-Chair. And I'll ask my colleague, uh, Victor Kyung. Victor, uh, could you run us through the uh, people that have registered for testimony and um, notify us who's, uh, who's first uh, to speak, please? Surely, Tom. Yes, absolutely. Um, we have uh, five uh, individuals who have uh, offered to testify this, this afternoon, uh, beginning with uh, Chief Eric Morris of the Tesla and Flinket Council. Uh, the second person I have on the line is uh, Carly Knight of the Trondek Huachin government. 
Uh, the third individual is Don Taves, a former Yukon River Powell member. Uh, the fourth testifier is Dr. Stephanie Quinn Davidson of the Tanana Chiefs Conference. And finally, we have Arnold Damaski of the Mulatto Tribal Council. Thank you, and I see that we have uh, someone unmuted now and, and ready to speak, um, dialing in from a number ending 526. If you could please uh, confirm your name uh, and then be ready to proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Okay. Chief Eric Morris, uh, Tasman Quigley Council. I just wanted to uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. I just want to acknowledge and all of those that are participating in all this work that's happening. I want to give thanks to those that are being able to provide testimony today as well. I also wanted to just uh, give thanks to the to the Creator for our land and for our water and for all of the things that has been in creation. So. With that, I, I wanted to take this opportunity to say that, you know, Chinook salmon uh, represent a critical part of food security in the north, which is being further threatened by the effects of climate change and most recently the global pandemic that has taken place that's affecting us all in, in the world. You know, our citizens are observing abroad effects on many species of fish and wildlife, and our people have made sacrifice after sacrifice in recognition of the value of these species to, to, the, eco, to the ecosystem. And I think of all of that, and I think of, you know, just, uh, you know, we sacrifice, make these sacrifices, not just for ourselves, but for all of those that uh, utilize the resources that, that are, are, are in our ecosystems. The effects on Tesla Country Council as a result of these lost food sources cannot be overstated, and are closely linked to the physical, mental, and spiritual health of our citizens. You know, in Chapter 8 of the Yukon River Salmon Agreement, established under the Pacific Salmon Treaty, has has been in effect for nearly 20 years. And as, as uh, well, all established frameworks and agreements, there's great value in reflecting on what, what has and what hasn't worked and being open and to evolving and improving uh, all of these framework and agreements and being able to look at how we can improve on them and, and make them better and more reflective of our current needs, I think is re really critical. Although the agreement was not created with any provisions for review or renegotiation, uh, renegotiation timelines, TTC feels strongly that ongoing Chinook salmon declines and recurrence of Chum and salmon declines are inviting, the, are inviting the U.S. and Canada to take this opportunity to reopen and improve the agreement to achieve real results into the future. And I think this is, as, as I say, is... Uh, you know, we have to have that, that willingness to be able to do that, and if we don't, then it's, it's going to really impact us. The traditional knowledge will never be something that gets read into a textbook. However, it, it is the most reliable source of information. It's not measurable, and it's not an equation that, that you can solve. The traditional model needs, needs to be entrenched in the way you have been trained and groomed to truly understand its value and how it will form the decisions you make each and every day, as uh, pre the previous speaker just mentioned, you know, like uh, traditional knowledge has to be weighed in with, with scientific knowledge and have to have that balance. And that traditional knowledge is something that is with, with all of our communities in regards to uh, what we can offer to the work that's being done. We need to give our traditional knowledge keepers the same value as the scientific knowledge, as I just mentioned, we need to trust the traditional knowledge. And once we do, we truly we will truly understand the true significance of our salmon. And just in, in regard to that, I know that, you know, like I th we think about it, and we, we always take great pride in, in, in the history that we have with, with our salmon. You know, one of the things that we talk about most often to, the, to our visitors, to our lands is, is that when they look at the lake, they, they often think about lake trout and all of the fish that are normally in our lake. But when we tell them that we actually have salmon that come to our traditional territory, they kind of are in awe of that. And when we tell them that the salmon that travel here, it's one of the longest migrations of, of any species of salmon. 
and and they're, they're totally in awe of all of that. And I think it's something that's really significant about that. The intent of the agreement was to ensure that this is of the of, to ensure the sustainability of Yukon River Chinook. Kevin Clinker Council feels that it's time to amend this agreement to ensure the restoration and enhancement of Yukon River salmon populations. Now we need action on improving populations, not for harvest, but for the well-being of all of our ecosystem. You know, this year in the Yukon, we've had a, to euthanize like grizzly bears this winter. Even even the grizzly bears are not getting enough food to be able to sustain themselves and survive. And that alone should be alarming to all of us. And, you know, I think about the significance of that. And I think about not only just the grizzly bears, but all of the other animals that are out there that depend on this species. And uh, with that, I want to thank you very much for the time that you've given to us today to, to make this testimony. And God bless everyone. Thank you, Morris. I appreciate your testimony. Uh, and uh, next up, we have uh, Carly Knight of the Trondac Clinton government. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Perfect. So, hello everyone. I'd like to first thank the panel for allowing me to testify. My name is Kelly Knight and I'm the Fish and Wildlife Manager for the Tronda Quechin Government in Dawson City, Yukon. I'd also like to recognize that I live and work within the traditional territory of the Tronda Quechin First Nation. The Fish and Wildlife Branch at Trondic Witching Government would like to raise the following comments. We feel as though Fisheries and Oceans Canada is not listening or absorbing the in-season traditional and local knowledge. For example, on the Yurtsa call that happened every week over the summer, DFO continually only relied on the numbers captured at the two sonars, rather than listening to the folks who are actually on the river fishing. To borrow words from a colleague, we need to meaningfully bring in Indigenous knowledge and ensure Western science does not go it alone. Number two, we feel the need to develop a Yukon First Nation focused Yukon River Watershed Management Plan. If the run continues to decline, we think Yukon First Nations will be more effective with their conservation efforts if an approach to acceptable harvest limits is worked through and agreed upon. Number three, we feel very strongly that in-season harvest data collection needs to happen on the Alaska side of the border. In-season data, co in data collection and sharing is the only way we can assess what might actually be coming across the border uh, from Alaska to Yukon. Number four, we need more emphasis on the precautionary principle throughout the management approach on both sides of the river. The Yukon River Chinook stocks continue to decline year after year and are showing long-term trends of poor return. Until we have a better understanding of the causes attributing to this decline and human efforts show success in restoring a healthier run to the system, management and harvest should be guided by strong conservation-minded approaches and principles to ensure the persistence of this important stock for now and for our future generations. Again, to borrow words of wisdom from a colleague, we need to put the salmon first and ask, what do they need from us? We haven't come from a salmon perspective. Why are we here and what have we done? The salmon need our help as they are nearing extinction. Number five, mining is critical, mining in critical salmon habitat is a huge issue. The Canadian delegation stresses the importance of salmon numbers, health, etc. However, the Canadian Fisheries Act still allows for offsetting. Offsetting measures are not an adequate way of dealing with the decline of salmon stocks. No one can accurately recreate natural temperatures and pH levels. Salmon are very sensitive to a number of variables, including water temperatures and pH balance not to mention destruction of critical riparian areas that juveniles depend on for food sources and protection. In our view, offsetting does nothing to protect salmon numbers and their habitat. It's more of a justification 
to allow for development to occur in areas that are, are important to salmon and their habitat. Salmon occupy certain streams and areas for a reason. The conditions are right for their survival as a species. They should be reflected, and this should be reflected in legislation, so salmon have a fighting chance to reestablish themselves. In closing, like we heard yesterday, we too are part of the land and part of the water. These fish are not ours, but they are equal to us. I would like to thank you for listening to my testimony and thank you to the panel for hosting this virtual post-season session. I hope everyone stays safe and stays warm. Masi chou. Thank you very much, Carly, uh, for taking the time to testify this afternoon. Um, next, we have Don Taves, uh, the former Yukon River panel member. Hello, Don. Hi, it's Tom Alp here again. Don, if you are on the phone, uh, then you'll need to press star followed by six on your keypad to unmute your line uh, so that you can provide your testimony. Thank you. So can you hear me now? We can, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, my name is Don Taves and then I'd like to thank the the panel and the panel members and advisors and technical staff for giving me this opportunity to uh, provide some testimony. Uh, the, one of the advantages of grow, growing older and retiring is that uh, one really has no responsibilities and you can say what you really want to say and you have all the answers. Uh, you know, I, I miss being on the panel. I recognize that generational change is inevitable and necessary and organizations that need to plan for it. And I always see a good mixture of youth and experienced elders on the panel, JTC and, and in and management agencies is, is a good thing. And I think we probably have that uh, on the Yukon River management process. And of course, I'm defining youth as anyone who is under 60 years of age or young enough to be one of my children. Uh, just in terms of background, I was involved, I have been involved in the Yukon River Salmon Negotiations and Management since 1989 until uh, 2019, initially as a Chief of Fisheries for the Yukon and in the last four years as a Salmon Subcommittee member. I'm a fisheries biologist by training and career work experience. Uh, so my comments today are partly biological and technical, but also partly strategic and management planning in nature and maybe, maybe a bit of philosoph philosophical based on life experience. And as I said, I still have a great passion for Yukon River Salmon. I follow panel meetings and reports and uh, monitor in-season conferences. Uh, so yeah, salmon is really an important part of my life. Uh, just in terms, I'd like to give a little bit of a historic summary, you know, based on my long involvement. And I recognize uh, there's some of you on the panel were involved in the negotiations as well, like Virgil and uh, and Tim and and probably Roger and Carl and others. Uh, but prior to 1997, total runs of 3,000 Chinook were common. Were were basically that's what was happening with 150,000 Canadian origin Chinook, and and average total runs. Uh, today have uh, have declined by about 50% to about 150,000 Chinook. So we've had a 50% decline since to what things were like uh, on a fairly consistent basis up to 1970. The commercial fishery uh, took 150,000 Chinook in the lower river for many decades and a small, uh, and a small commercial fishery uh, in the Dawson area took 1,500 to 2,000, uh, 
15,000 to 20,000 Chinook. And of course, there's been no commercial fishing in the U.S. since 2010, and no commercial fishing in Canada since I think about the mid 1990s. As I said, I was involved in the negotiations, and I I, I don't recall that there ever being any consideration and discussion of ever having to limit the subsistence fishery in the U.S. or the First Nation food fishery in Canada. All the discussion and all the negotiations was about harvest shares involved the commercial fishery and the assumption that there was always be enough Chinook for subsistence needs in both countries. The first serious discussion of limiting subsistence fishery in the U.S. Uh, occurred in 2008 with a walk-in application by ADF&G to the R&E Fund. This was at a pre-season meeting in St. Mary's, uh, and, and the application was for pre-season meetings with fishers and communities in the U.S., on how to limit and manage a subsistence harvest if necessary. So that was in 2008. That's the first discussion we ever had of actually limiting subsistence harvesting in, in the U.S. And there was really no a serious attempt to limit subsistence harvest in the U.S. until 2012, although in 2009 there was some attempts, and they're on, as some of you, most of you will remember, came back quite a bit stronger and there was a lot of concern about fishes that, you know, they could have fished more and they didn't fish. And then, of course, from 2012, when we had the first serious attempt at subsistence harvest uh, management, there were the closures of, complete closures of 2013-14 and a part closure in 2015. <clears throat> Some Canadian First Nations who as governments managed their First Nation fish, we voluntarily limited their harvest even before the treaty was ratified in 2003. For example, Tez and Clinkett Council, Council and others like uh, Toronto Gwich'in uh, First Nation and Nachanayak Dunn First Nation in later years had harvesting moratoriums and Selkirk First Nation with their visionary management plan. And for those of you who haven't seen the plan, it really is an amazing document. And it actually prescribes a precautionary harvest allocation of a 15 Chinook per family at the start of the season uh, until, until they know what the, the run strength is going to be. And, you know, the real, uh, things like the release of large fe or females uh, that are in good condition. So it's an amazing document that was uh, finalized about three or four years ago. And for those of you who haven't actually had a look at it, you should probably make sure you do. <coughs> management, and especially in-season management, has improved enormously with sonar projects at Pilot and Eagle and in-season genetic analysis of the run at Pilot, monitoring of escapement projects in both U.S. and Canada, Bering Sea trawling work to monitor juvenile abundance, uh, management and changes in both U.S. and Canada to limit mesh size and Chinook bycatch during the summer chum season in the U.S., for example, the, implement, uh, the implementation of a dip in St. Ant fishery for commercial summer chum fishery, that was a big deal. <coughs> Excuse me. And of course, greatly, you know, really improved bycatch provisions in the Pollock Sea or in the Bering Sea Pollock fishery. Expenditures of U.S. 2.2 million annually for more than two, uh, 20 million in total on salmon restoration or enhancement since 2002 over the past 19 years with the RNE fund. Climate change is obviously having a real effect as Yukon River temperatures have been above average for five of, the, five of the last six years in the lower river and at potentially lethal levels for Chinook in 2019. And the North is seeing an increasing increase of land failures to permafrost melting, which is affecting water quality. <coughs> So where are we in 2021, and what are the realities? Yukon River Chinook stocks have been, been in decline since 1997 and are continuing to decline in spite, in spite of greatly improved management and reduced harvest and R&E fund expenditures. No commercial fishery and significant limitations and complete closures on subsistence in First Nations fisheries in recent years and no likelihood in any change of these trends. So we're going to see more closures, more restrictions, and more closures in the foreseeable future. 
salmon runs in communities at the extreme range in the Yukon River drainage most affected, for example, Chesed and Whitehorse, and returns in the past several years in these in, in the in the uh, uh, are really alarming, especially at Whitehorse and and, uh, and at, on the Big Salmon River this year. And I think these runs could be heading towards functional extinction. And by functional extinction, I mean we'll always have a few salmon, but there won't be enough to really even uh, contemplate a fishery. And fishers won't be prepared to go and fish at those low densities anyway. Chinook runs everywhere in decline, and Chinook runs everywhere in, uh, on the Pacific coast are in decline and rapidly moving to extinction in the lower 48 in the U.S. and to functional extinction in the B.C. and southeast Alaska. If these tr the trend continues, there won't be a lot of fishing of any kind uh, in the next several decades, simply because the densities will be too low. The outlook for Chinook does not look good, and there is no reason to believe that the Yukon River will not follow this course over the longer term. However, Yukon River Chinook runs are still relatively healthy and viable and from a biological perspective, i.e. we still have good numbers of six-year-old fish and even some seven-year-old fish, which is really, really rare. I think that's really unusual in terms of when you look at all the Chinook runs and, and are getting where else uh, and, and uh, there's still reason for optimism with respect to the future of the run on the Yukon River, in my view. Yukon River salmon are not created equal, and Canadian origin salmon have been shown to be larger and older than U.S. Chinook based on studies by Randy Brown and others. This is not an accident. Uh, whether a fish makes a 2,000-mile journey or a 200-mile journey is a big deal, and the fish are involved have evolved uh, uh, over many, many, many long time to actually to be able to do this. And, and actually for Canadian origin Chinook to spend an extra year growing to a larger size in a marine environment and the, the mortality associated before spawning is an adaptive measure for the rigors, the rigors of this 3,000 kilometer spawning migration. Monitoring at Eagle has consistently shown that Canadian origin Chinook have a higher percentage of six and seven year olds and a high percentage of females. And again, this is not a coincidence. This is by design. This allows them to make that journey and to be, and to be, uh, you know, undertake spawning, you know, uh, way, way up the watershed. The decline and future loss of harvestable, harvestable Canadian ordnance Chinook will affect the U.S. as much as Canada as 55 to 65 percent, 60% of the U.S. harvest is Canadian origin fish, and 100% of the, uh, the harvest in the upper river is Canadian origin fish. So it's not just Canada who is affected. Many, many uh, communities and fishers in Alaska will be very dramatically affected if the Canadian origin uh, stock continues to decline. <coughs> Excuse me. The history of salmon management and fisheries management in general is, has been always a little too late, and if only we had done something sooner. And I hope we are not in that situation on the Yukon River. Generational change and changing norms and baseline lead us to expect less and feel that things are okay, even if runs and harvests have dramatically, dramatically declined. And the rationale, if a year or two of improving runs uh, rationale that a year or two of improving runs, then things are okay and things are improving. And the reality is it's, it's probably human nature to look for positive indicators and why it is continue, okay to continue to do what we, are, we have been doing in the past. With productivity of around one to two over the past decade instead of three to four fish on average, historically, uh, Escapement goals have become largely meaningless in my view. If there is little or no harvestable surplus, i.e. Uh, if the productivity is near one, any harvest will result in further stock declines. And we're essentially drawing down on the principal in the bank, which is okay for a short term for a year or two, but not for longer term trends. Not meeting escapement goals for a, year, for a few years is not, however, is not a problem when the productivity is high and we have a productivity of three or four fish returning for every adult spawner. 
but a real prob problem when productivity is low. And I'd like to commend the management staff in both countries in having done a tremendous job over the past decade of addressing the above realities and communicating these concerns to fishers and communities, and, and they are com uh, to be commended and supported. I think they've done a great job, but we still need to, the job isn't done. We need to, we need to improve upon what we're doing. In terms of where to from here and what are the options for the future, the economic, social, and cultural concerns of fishers and communities in both countries with respect to the need for Chinook harvest is completely understandable in terms of short-term survival, i.e., if you don't have food, the outcome is not good. And this, but this does not change the realities as outlined above. Management approaches of the Yukon River Panel and management agencies have always been short-term, i.e., what can we harvest this year while meeting escapement objectives? And I might add that the Bering Sea trawling data and work has actually helped the panel to start looking at multi-year considerations by giving us multi-year projections uh, of what the run strengths may be like. A longer-term management and planning approach of at least several decades or several cycles uh, is required if the options for these benefits are to be maintained over the long term for future generations, in addition to year-to-year -year harvest management, which is obviously necessary. The unthinkable question needs to be asked. If Chinook ransom populations decline to levels where there is no harvestable surplus, what, what uh, what would we still would we still want to maintain Chinook stocks on the landscape for ecological and existing purposes? And I just need to expand a little bit on what we mean by ecological and existence purposes. You know, in, in my long tenure with the panel and in the Yukon River salmon management process, I don't recall ever being any significant discussions about the ecological value of Chinook to the landscape. These fish that carry nutrients and fertilizer from the ocean back up to 3,000 miles upriver to uh, fertilize aquatic systems and terrestrial systems. We had never discussed that. And so even if we couldn't harvest them, would the, the ecological values of Chinook be important? And in terms of the existence value of, of, of Chinook, even if we can't harvest them, would we, or would we actually be willing to sacrifice our harvest to make sure that Chinook continues to exist on the landscape? And this is, re this is important for several reasons. One is that if they're part of the ecosystem, but also things that are affecting Chinook stocks now, like climate change, and uh, those will be addressed, hopefully will be addressed over the next, maybe it'll take 20 years, maybe it'll take 50 years, but would it be worthwhile to maintain Chinook on the landscape, even if we can't harvest them? And, uh, and also, uh, you know, we've had very, very rapid environmental changes, but I'm absolutely confident that Chinook can adapt they, through the natural selection process, but they need to be given some time. It's not going to happen in, in a, over one cycle. They're going to need many decades and many cycles to actually do this. But I think we give them a chance, they will actually adapt. So I'd just like to make a few recommendations in point form. In addition to the annual harvest management strategy of the Yukon River Panel and the Joint Technical Committee, we need to develop a medium to long-term management strategy and a plan for at least a full cycle or two, i.e. six to 12 years. <clears throat> at a minimum, adf and managers should wait until the midpoint of the Chinook run before initiating harvest openings, i.e. use a precautionary approach at these critical times for Chinook. The next point, that a maximum of a six inch mesh size restriction be implemented for the entire season across all harvest zones and further studies be undertaken to ensure <coughs> that this is still the most appropriate mesh size to limit the next the negative effects of size selective harvest. If current declines continue to move, if current declines continue, we need to we need to move to Plan B and implement harvest closures both in the U.S. and Canada for at least a cycle, i.e., six years, 
And, you know, maybe we could consider allowing a minimal harvest Canadian origin Chinook for cultural and social purposes, regardless of the run strength. So every year we would allow some harvest for cultural and, and social and ceremonial purposes. You know, and this could be maybe 4,000 Chinook in the U.S. and 1,000 Chinook in Canada in line with treaty harvest years. This approach would allow for cultural camps and training of future generations and give everyone a taste of Chinook until things improve and ultimately uh, will not make a difference to whether the Yukon River Chinook survive for the future. It'd be a low level of harvest. And I know this is controversial. I know some panel members feel very strongly that we need to have a complete closure, but I could see the rationale for a cultural harvest every year, regardless of what the size of the run is, but we cannot cheat. That is, if we do this for six years or for a couple of cycles, and we happen to get a good run, we cannot go and harvest the surplus of a good run. We have to stick with it for the whole period of, uh, for the whole cycle or for the whole period that we're, that we're implementing uh, this plan. I think the most important thing is the discussions with fishers and communities be initiated as soon as possible on the above scenario as plan B, on plan B to, to prepare everyone in case things don't improve, i.e. Uh, increase this, uh, uh, and, and by improve, I mean we absolutely need an increase, a sustained increase in productivity over, over a few, few years before we can say that things are improving. You know, uh, an increase in productivity and improvement of the run for a year or two isn't enough. We need to look at it at least, at least three or four years or a cycle of, a, of increased productivity. And then after, after uh, we've done this, we practice this harvest management regime for a cycle or maybe a couple of cycles, then we need to re renew this approach. And, and to ensure long-term survival of, of, of Yukon River Chinook. So those are all the comments I have, and I'm sorry if I'm a little bit, uh, if I'm coughing a little bit and spluttering a bit, but, uh, you know, I, uh, yeah, thanks for listening to me, and I really appreciate the opportunity that I've had to really express my thoughts and feelings in this regard. So have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Don. Uh, it's good to hear from you again and, uh, and for taking the time to testify this afternoon. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Stephanie Cohn davidson Hi there, everyone. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, good afternoon, everyone. This is Stephanie Quinn davidson um, I guess today I'm actually going to address the panel and everyone who's kind of watching on YouTube here, uh, just from my own personal self, not in any affiliation with Tanana Chiefs Conference or the Yukon River Intertribal Fish Commission, um, because a, a lot of the things that I have to say are just uh, things that I've been thinking about on my own over the last two days and haven't had a chance to run it by our fish commissioners or Tanana Chiefs Conference, um, but are things that I, I want to be able to uh, share with you all. Um, I didn't write it all down, so I apologize if I kind of jump from topic to topic here and ramble on, but in, in thinking about the future of the Yukon salmon runs, um, I feel like we kind of have two problems occurring. One, and, and I'm talking primarily about the Chinook run, one is that we are, we're, we're seeing relatively low runs, and we're going to continue to see relatively low runs in future years. Low salmon runs are not going away. This is, this is a fact that we all need to get comfortable with and accept and figure out ways how to deal with low salmon runs. No change in, uh, and we're not going to target the Bering Sea Pollock fishery and shut them down completely and expect our king salmon to return to this river. That's not the culprit. I suspect that something is happening that is keeping these salmon runs low that is out of our control. All we have to do is look at the escapements in 2014 and 15, which are the 
escapement years that contributed to the major age classes for this year. And in 2014 and 15, we had high escapement. We went well over the, the escapement goal at the border. And yet we have a run that ends up being one of the lowest runs we've seen in a while. And, and that's not a management failure. That's not, you know, the managers those years. And I will raise my hand. I'm a culprit of that. I was one of those managers who allowed so many uh, uh, king salmon to get across the border that year more than, than we needed to. Um, and, and what did it produce for us? Right. There's something happening that's impacting our salmon that's that's out of our control. And the other issue is that we have this uncertainty with making management decisions based on a project that's at the mouth of the river. And then we have nothing else for a thousand miles before we know whether this run is truly the size we believe it is. And so I will say that Tannen All Chiefs Conference is committed to pursuing a sonar feasibility project starting this summer in cooperation uh, primarily with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, but also in consultation with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game uh, to try and, and mitigate that and see if we can put a project in the water that will, will help us better um, understand the run size as it's moving through the river and be able to take actions earlier in the season, either both to restrict more or to allow more fishing. Um, depending on what that run size is showing. So we have these, these kind of two problems we're dealing with. And at the same time, we're asking people every single year to conserve. And we're asking them, people in, in rural Alaska, where we don't have grocery stores in some of our, in some of our communities, where milk costs $15 a gallon in some of our communities, where gas is $8 a gallon, we're asking them not to harvest salmon voluntarily above and beyond the measures that are being in place, put in place to protect salmon. And, and we're doing that without providing them any kind of support. And, and I put this on, you know, myself, I put this on uh, the organization I work for. I put this on the panel. We are continually asking people to bear the brunt of an issue that is not their fault. And I think that this pandemic has really enlightened me to that because, you know, in our countries, we have shut down businesses, uh, restaurants and bars and movie theaters and all these places where we know COVID spreads very easily when you have a lot of people in a room packed together. We've shut them down. And as a result, our government has come in and provided support to those businesses so that they can remain shut down. And we've seen in communities where you don't have that support, uh, those businesses continue to stay open and COVID has spread uh, pretty rampantly through those communities. Well, I view this issue with the Yukon King Salmon the same. We're asking people to take on this, this burden without giving them the support that they need to deal with these low salmon runs. And so um, I think we need to think outside the box about how can we be supporting uh, both uh, the communities in Alaska and the Yukon Territory as they continue to deal with low salmon runs that aren't going away anytime in the near future. Uh, I think that r &E Fund does some of that through culture camps. Um, it is something that Tanana Chiefs is going to be pursuing more to uh, provide culture camps in areas to have a way to still pass on the tradition and the knowledge uh, while still harvesting a small amount of salmon. Uh, this year, for the first time, I guess now I am speaking on behalf of Tanana Chiefs, so I'll put that hat on for a little bit right now. This year, for the first time, Tanana Chiefs purchased salmon that uh, we have been delivering out to our communities the last few weeks here. Uh, we purchased 75,000 pounds of salmon from the Bristol Bay region and from the Kotzebue region to supplement the low harvest that we saw on the river this year. And, and that's no easy feat. Uh, we spent um, well over $400,000 in that uh, effort. And I actually just want to thank Virgil Umpenhauer, who I think is on the line, for all the help that um, he's provided in storing that frozen salmon, boxing it up, processing it for us, and getting it out um, to the cargo company to get it out to all the villages. So thanks a lot, Virgil, for all of your help with that. But 
that is, you know, that was a tough decision to buy salmon from outside of the region this year. But I realized we can't have our people not eating. We can't ask them to not have food in their freezer because the salmon didn't return no fault of their own. And so that's something we're going to be looking at of how can we support our communities moving forward to deal with these low salmon runs, um, while at the same time continuing to advocate for uh, the management decisions and regulations and policies that would protect a way of life. Um, okay, I'm taking my TCC hat off now. And I guess I just want to say that, you know, this, this panel process, um, it's good that we have something in place to bring the two countries together. Because if we didn't have this and there were nothing, I'm sure it would be a complete, you know, uh, <laughs> it would be chaos, right? But we at least have this. That doesn't mean that this process is perfect. And I think there's a lot of room for improvement. And I would love to see some new ideas, new conversations at the 2021 preseason meeting. I have been coming to the panel meetings now. I first came as an employee of the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, and then I've been coming now in my capacity with TCC for almost a decade. And, and I can predict with some level of certainty, some significant level of certainty, the conversations that are going to happen every year. They're the same ones, the same things that people are saying. If we were to go back and look at the transcripts from meetings from the last 10 years, we would see a pattern. And I just wonder what good that is doing us because we keep having the same conversations and what is changing. We are still faced with low salmon runs. And so I want, I would love to see this, this group shake things up and come to the table with new ideas. And certainly there's, you have to go over the r &E proposals, right? Like that is, you are obligated to, to uh, dole out that money. But I think we need a whole new approach. Um, you know, Canada asking Alaska to have more input on their management, that has not gotten us anywhere in the last 10 years. Uh, you know, uh, Alaska, talking about how, you know, there's a certain percentage of females that we're getting across the border and Canada saying, well, that's not enough. That hasn't gotten us anywhere. We are still in this position. So I just want to urge the panel members um, and anyone listening on the phone to think of new ways that we can have conversations, uh, new conversations, new ideas. I, I really appreciated a lot of the points that Don just brought up now. And, and they're outside of the box and they're um, maybe drastic and a hard pill to swallow right now, but gosh, we need something new. Uh, like I said, these low salmon runs aren't going away anytime soon. We, we need something uh, bigger to shake things up. So with that, I'll just say thanks for the opportunity to uh, testify today. And I also just want to give a kudos to uh, the team behind the scenes running the show. I've been really impressed with how well this meeting has been able to come together uh, with people from, you know, spread across thousands of miles of remote Alaska and Yukon territory. Uh, and so just a, a major kudos to the team pulling this off. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. And, and see you guys in a, hopefully a few months to, with your new ideas. Many thanks, uh, Stephanie, for taking the time to testify this afternoon. Uh, good to hear from you again. And finally, we have uh, Arnold Mosky of the Nulato Tribal Council. You all hear me okay? Okay, Arnold, thank you. Okay, um, so this is my first time calling in to this meeting. Um, I just, um, I'm just calling in because I'm concerned about the future of our salmon. 
Coleman. This, um, it's been an unusual year for fishing. And, um, I'm a fisherman from uh, the Middle Yukon, specifically Y4A. It was an unusual season. Um, yeah, just really weird. Um, we also, um, it was really slow fishing. Um, also, uh, weird not catching much dog salmon when we're fishing for kings. That was really weird. Um, those changes, I mean, everything is changing. Um, uh, lots of things are changing with the salmon. Uh, we got to figure it out. Um, you just don't know what's going on um, with the salmon, and it's really, it's really stressing. I mean, uh, the, the salmon been declining in the past 30 years, and there's nothing that um, we have done as humans to figure out what's happening to it. I mean, uh, I agree uh, with Stephanie. We have to figure out um, new ways, uh, new innovative ways to figure out what's going on. Um, uh, I, I just want my, my boys, I just want my uh, two boys, two little boys to uh, grow up um, eating salmon. I mean, it's really essential to our culture, and I just want in our village. Um, yeah, it's just been an unusual year. I mean, uh, in a lot of areas, the salmon run was one of those areas, and uh, yeah, uh, it's just really weird with everything changing. I mean, the climate change, climate change is, um, have an effect on it. Um, yeah, uh, it's just, uh, I'd like to see changes in the, ma uh, not management, but, uh, I'd like to see, like, um, um, decisions being made. I mean, I'm trying, uh, we've been trying to, um, probably the same things for the past 30 years, and we just need new ways, I mean, new ideas. Um, really concerned what's happening. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, uh, I don't know, we just got to, we just got to figure out ways to just make sure there's uh, King Salmon for the future generation. All I really want to stress, it's just uh, really concerning and alarming. I mean, uh, uh yeah, no, um, I just, uh, I, I feel like, uh, that the pilot station sonar is not giving off, um, the right information. I mean, um, I'm thankful for what it does and the information that provide the managers, but I just don't feel like it's, uh, like it's providing accurate information. Uh, we all we all see the numbers, and in the back of our minds, we're just saying, "Oh yeah, it's a number. It's probably higher or lower." Um, we don't. Know it, but uh, um, yeah, having a a sonar at the mouth that um Stephanie uh, mentioned it. Uh, I support that, and that'll that'll be something new. Um, yeah, we just don't know what's happening to our salmon in the Yukon. We don't know what's happening out in the ocean. So um. Ways to you know, um, I don't know. I just I, I'm just um, concerned for the salmon run for future generations. That that's all I want to stress. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Um, thank you all for um, allowing me to uh, testify here today, and um, thank you for everybody um, who put this on. And it was really good meeting the past two days. Great, thank you, Arnold, uh, for taking the time to testify this afternoon, and. Uh, um, I believe uh, that was the last public testimony that was uh, registered for today. And I'll go uh, back to the uh, co-chairs. Very much, uh, Victor and Tom. And uh, on behalf of the Yukon River panel, I'd like to express our appreciation to uh, those that provided testimony this afternoon uh, from throughout the Yukon River watershed. Uh, the Yukon River panel certainly does value the, the perspectives that you share with us and certainly appreciate uh, the time uh, that you've invested in both preparing to provide your testimony and taking the time to deliver it uh, at, these, uh, at these meetings. So thank you very much for that. Uh, as far as the, uh, the bilateral meeting agenda goes, uh, we are uh, at the conclusion. So essentially um, our second last item is uh, confirming the 2021 preseason Yukon River panel meeting. So uh, at the present time, uh, we're envisioning that the meeting will be held in the first half of April 
the specific dates will be confirmed uh, over the next uh, few weeks. Uh, at this point in time, we're, we're uh, also anticipating uh, that it will be most likely a virtual session, just given the, the current uh, circumstances and situations uh, around uh, international travel restrictions uh, related to the, uh, the global pandemic. So, uh, we will do our best to uh, prepare uh, early on and provide information as soon as it's available with regards to the specific dates for the, the 2021 preseason meeting, but uh, rest assured uh, we are targeting the early portion of, of April. Uh, before we move to closing remarks, uh, perhaps I'll check with uh, U.S. Co-Chair John Linderman. Uh, any final uh, items you uh, would like to address as part of our meeting agenda before we proceed with uh, closing remarks and adjournment? Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Um, I guess maybe on the uh, on that given topic for the 2021 uh, preseason meeting scheduling, um, just something to bear in mind um, that was brought up in discussion um, within the U.S. section is accounting for the holiday around Easter um, and trying to bear that in mind um, as we proceed with uh, uh, scheduling of that meeting. Um, we do have a preference, but I'm not sure if maybe you need to engage with your section members a little bit more to ensure that uh, there's no conflicts um, on the Canadian side. So um, we can perhaps follow up on that um, at a later time um, uh, to nail down um, the week and the specific dates and how we plan to organize uh, the April meeting. That, uh, that would work well, uh, thank you. And so certainly we'll target to uh, have that information posted to the Yukon River Panels website, uh, I would expect uh, in, in February at some point. So uh, we will work to ensure that that's available in a timely manner. Okay, so with that, uh, we will basically transition to closing remarks. Uh, I would like to uh, extend our appreciation to panel members, uh, advisors, uh, members of the public, and other participants uh, who have joined us for this week's virtual Yukon River panel uh, meeting session. Um, we specifically appreciate your, your patience with the virtual meeting. I think uh, overall we've done our best to make it as seamless as possible, but uh, do recognize that uh, virtual meeting uh, will never replace the uh, the value of the in-person in, in sessions. So we do hope to return to uh, in-person sessions uh, in in the future when uh, when it's uh, when it's possible to accommodate that. But uh, certainly as a uh, as an alternative, uh, the virtual meeting platform has brought some value in uh, providing the opportunity to to share perspectives, uh, to exchange ideas uh, and information, and certainly. Uh, start to look forward to preparing for the 2021. So uh, before we move to panel members for any closing remarks, perhaps I'll uh, pass it over to U.S. Co-Chair John Linderman. Uh, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. I want to extend a thank you to um, all panel members, um, to staff and agency support staff uh, for the excellent presentation. Um, presentations given over the course of this meeting, uh, very informative and, and generate a lot of good commentary questions and discussion. I think there's a lot of really good food for thought um, that's been presented over the course of this meeting. Um, and I also want to very much extend a thank to our uh, public testimony and those that took the time to testify to the panel, um, not just today and the higher number of individuals that uh, took advantage of that opportunity, but also yesterday. Again, good food for thought. I think it's something that uh, the panel uh, is appreciative of, of hearing, uh, needs to hear uh, to some extent, and uh, we'll look forward to uh, additional conversations leading up to the April meeting. Sure, and uh, so perhaps we'll go to uh, Canadian panel members for any closing remarks, and we'll start with uh, panel members Carl, Roger, and Al. Any closing remarks you'd like to share? Carl, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, first off, I'd like to make an apology to all the people that are participating and listening in that we usually do have an opening and closing prayer at our meetings. I'm just not sure what happened this time. 
Anyhow, uh, I just wanted to um, put the put the panel on notice that uh, this fall, the Yukon River Salmon Agreement will be 20 years old. I don't know how we're going to celebrate that, or if, if we even should. Um, I just want to make my comment short. I just I feel that um, these testimonies should have a rebuttal. I think not at the present time, but uh, in the future, I, I believe. I just feel that these people that take the time to do testimonies should at least be given the opportunity to know that we acknowledge and hear what they're saying. And uh, if we're going to work on something that they've recommended, I think we should give them a little update on that. So I'm not sure if Al and Roger had comments, but personally, I thank you very much. And I think Al will make closing comments. And then Roger. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Yes, uh, Co-Chairs, thank you so much for the meeting that you held. Um, it did go relatively seamlessly. We did a little bit of, a little bit of problems with the computers, but overall, I think it well went well. And I'm looking forward to seeing or hearing you all in April sometime. So thanks again, Roger. Yeah, Roger. Yeah, um, I'd like to thank everyone that uh, being involved with this um, <clears throat> Yukon River. Am I on? Uh, you're back, Roger. Go ahead. And um, also, I'd like to and thank and everyone on both both sides uh, all the efforts that's been done to try and save the salmon for the next generation. It's important that one there. <clears throat> and also important to use both um, contemporary and traditional methods. We have to acknowledge those. Systems, uh, which are one of the main important tools that uh, and would get us a long ways. And I've been hearing too uh, on the Yukon River funding proposals uh, all all the um, <clears throat> the salmon price that go back to the route back to the ocean. You know, if can you if you can imagine seven years later coming back and if we have less salmon fries going back down going to be drastically um effect, infected by um by their returns because it'd be way less. You know, even though we have um you call uh, assistance the Yukon River Panel funding. You know, there's something wrong here. There's something drastically wrong because um, and the mortality of and these fries here is getting less and less. It's got to be more than um, just um, climate changes. There could be some other effects that we need to investigate into. We're going to you know, reach uh, next generation to generations, I think we need to be serious about uh, investigating into these things. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone and and good luck on your endeavors. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Roger. And uh, we'll just check in with uh, our remaining Canadian panel members. Any closing remarks? Uh, Sure. <laughs> um, I hope I'm not cutting anybody off there. Um, no, I just wanted to, I won't take long because I, I feel like the remarks from the closing testimony really um, highlighted a lot of my thinking. I wanted to thank Don Taves, a mentor of mine, and I, I couldn't have stated it uh, any differently. It was uh, really, really excellent. Um, 
I guess, you know, the, the status quo is not working. Um, you know, we all share that responsibility that we have to do better. Um, I think the, the challenge uh, has been accepted that we have to do something new and innovative and, and do our best. Um, it's going to require us to step away from this, this current structure that we have in this process. I think there are limitations to it. And I think there's uh, some real challenges that are not working in the best interest of the salmon here. Um, so, you know, again, we all share that responsibility to try to make, make that progress. Um, yeah, and it's gonna, it's gonna require us to be brave and be vulnerable, have some difficult conversations, but I'm confident we can get there. Uh, something Stephanie said, um, you know, I, I, someone once told me to be hard, hard on the problem, not on the people. Um, and, you know, and I think sometimes it's easy to, for, for managers on both sides, to you know, feel defensive and 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 you know, we're watching a, a run that's not doing very well. And you know, to her point, I think she articulated it very well. This is not the managers did have done what they can do, and the managers are doing the best they can do. I think we just have to innovate, look outside of this process a bit more, and and uh, challenge ourselves to do it differently and better. And I and I've always felt like the solutions are not going to come from science. Science is not going to save us here. In fact, I think science is. I think that it's going to come from the people along the river. So with that, um, thank you. And uh, we'll, uh, we hope to carry on. Very much, uh, Dennis. And uh, we'll conclude uh, Canadian panel member closing remarks with uh, Tim Gerberding. Uh, go ahead, Tim. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, we've definitely got our challenges, but I think we can find solutions. And I look forward to continuing our discussions in April. So long, everybody. Tim, uh, perhaps uh, I'll ask uh, any closing remarks from uh, US panel members. Uh, go ahead, uh, Andy. My apologies, I thought I unmuted. Um, I wanted to thank you, Steve, uh, for running a great meeting. I, I think he did an excellent job, superb job of, of uh, getting us through this new format. And I know it, it's uh, very difficult, but I thought it worked extremely well. Um, I, I guess I just wanna echo exactly what Dennis uh, Zimmerman just said. I, I can't agree with more with what he said. He um, Dante's, uh, thank you very much. I, I, Don and I have been friends for a long time on this panel. We think a lot alike. And I, I think he has a great deal of wisdom through observation. I always say experience is knowledge. And uh, he has a tremendous amount of experience. So I, I really value the knowledge and the insight that Don brings to um, our process here. And I especially want to thank Stephanie. Um, I think you hit the ball right on the head there. And that is that um, we have to think outside the box. Um, human beings seldom change until they're forced to change. And when they are forced to change, at that point, it's often too late. And so um, we're armed with a lot of information. We're armed with um, the abilities. And I think what's most critical at this point in time in the Yukon River panel is outreach, communication, and education to all the people on the river so that they fully understand what they're up against and what it's gonna to take to fix the problem. I think there's not a single person on this river that wants to see salmon go away. I think everybody very strongly wants to support salmon for their future generations. Um, but I think a lot of people, my observations are a lot of people don't realize what it's going to take. They say they've sacrificed and we all have, but it's going to take more than that. Um, it's going to take a collective action. It's going to take a whole new paradigm of looking at how we view our salmon runs and how we harvest and, and utilize our salmon runs. And, and I think Don spoke to that a little bit. And I guess I'd like to just end my comments with, I think we've all been given a homework assignment 
And that homework assignment is to come back in the springtime with an open mind and some ideas outside the box and the willingness to leave some of our former positions behind and openly discuss um, new ways that we can look at management of the Yukon River, harvest of the Yukon River fish, and most importantly, conservation long-term, Don hit it right on the head, long-term conservation with no exceptions. That's the only way I feel we have an opportunity of saving these salmon. Um, with that, I close and thank you very, again very much, Mr. Co-Chair, for an excellently run meeting. Thank you, Andy. Uh, and we'll just uh, check uh, any closing remarks, additional closing remarks from U.S. panel members. Hey, I think uh, I think that is it. I apologize if I'm uh, missing uh, someone on the list. I'll just check uh, with uh, Mr. Co-Chair. Um, are we okay to conclude? Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Co-Chair. I expect that our members will would speak up um, given the opportunity. Okay. Well, thank you uh, very much, and uh, appreciate everyone's patience. Uh, we did run a little bit over time, but uh, certainly time well invested in, in respect of uh, providing the opportunity to hear public testimony and, uh, and exchange perspectives and information, because certainly that's how uh, we'll be able to advance uh, challenging some of these very, very difficult problems. And certainly look forward to uh, meeting with all of you again in a few weeks, uh, few weeks time in the spring of 2021. And in the meantime, uh, take care of yourselves, uh, stay healthy, and uh, look forward to, uh, to meeting again. Thank you.